What's up, guys? It's yo boy Omnisensei back with, what if Naruto had a leveling up system? Naruto x Harem. Part 3. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel, and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. You damn brat Zabuza shouted angrily as he leaped out of the water and dove towards Naruto, who quickly raised his three-pronged kunai. Zabuza raised his broadsword up and swung it down at the blonde. Suddenly, Kakashi in front of Naruto. Clang. Kakashi clashed with Zabuza's broadsword with a kunai of his own. He glared menacingly at Zabuza, leaking out killing intent that would make a normal man have suicidal thoughts. A great execution, you three. Kakashi muttered. Sakura smiled. It's thanks to Naruto, he was the one who created the plan after all. Sakura replied. Kakashi nodded and looked into Zabuza's eyes. I'll tell you right now, I don't fall for the same thing twice. What will you do now, Zabuza Kakashi asked. Zabuza gritted his teeth under his mask and jumped back onto the water. Kakashi did the same, mimicking Zabuza's movements. Kakashi stared at Zabuza as he mimicked the hand seal Zabuza was doing seal for seal. After performing 44 hand seals, they ended it with a bird seal at the same time. Water style. Water dragon jutsu. Both shouted at the same time. The water in the lake they were standing on started molding into the shape of two dragons. Two large water dragons with glowing yellow eyes formed in front of the two shinobi, clashed against each other with a loud roar, cancelling each other out. The attack sent a large wave flying towards the genin and Tazuna. Sakura performed a couple of hand seals. Earth-style barrier Sakura placed her hands on the ground and created a solid wall to serve as a defensive barricade, manipulating pre-existing Earth to rise up and take form. Using this technique is apparently extremely simple, to the point where it can be taught to even non-primary Earth release users in a matter of seconds. The tall Earth barrier blocked the violent wave of water. Zabuza prepares another attack, only to realize that Kakashi is mimicking everything he does. That freaky eye is pissing me off. Right. Kakashi asks after finishing Zabuza's sentence for him. Heh. All you're doing is copying me. You can't beat me you monkey bastard. Can't beat me you monkey bastard. Kakashi copied Zabuza's sentence for word word without even trying. Zabuza widened his eyes in anger. Damn you Kakashi. I'll make sure you never open the stupid mouth ever again. Zabuza declared before weaving through hand seals. Before he could even finish them, Kakashi already did. What the water style? Giant vortex jutsu Kakashi shouted before sending a huge vortex of water at a shocked Zabuza. Kakashi was attacking Zabuza with his own jutsu, something Zabuza only had been thinking of doing. Zabuza was blasted through the air and only stopped when he hit a tree with enough force to the bark. Before anything else could happen several kunai were launched at him, hitting him in his arms, left leg and torso. Zabuza coughed up blood violently, staining his bandages as it leaked out of his mouth. He looked up at Kakashi who was crouching on a tree branch before him with a kunai in his hand. Can you see the future? Zabuza asked him based on what he had just seen. Kakashi raised his kunai. Yeah, and I can see your death. Kakashi replied, but just before he could deal the finishing blow, several senbin pierced Zabuza's neck. Zabuza's eyes rolled up in the back of his head as he fell to the ground. You were right, this was going to be his final battle. A mysterious person appeared before them while standing on a tree branch looking at Kakashi. Her name is Haku. She is an orphan from the land of water, and a descendant of the Yuki clan. She later became a shinobi under Zabuza's tutelage whom she later partnered with, ultimately becoming a mercenary ninja. The Kanoha shinobi do not know that she is Zabuza's partner, they think she is a hunter nin here to assassinate him. Haku had long black hair, pale skin and large dark brown eyes, and a slender frame. Haku's normal shinobi outfit consisted of the standard Karigakur pinstriped outfit which stopped at his knees. Over this she wore a green heiori with white trimmings, and around her waist, a brown sash with a fringe trail wrapped around her waist twice. 
She also wore light brown platoon sandals with straps. She had nail polish on her fingernails and toenails in matching blue-green color. When wearing this outfit, Haku's long hair was gathered in a white bun holder. Haku also wore a black forehead protector with the Karigakur symbol upon it. When in battle or moving covertly, she wore a hunter nin mask on top of her forehead protector, which was white with thin curved eye holes, and a red wavy design in place of the mouth, as well as the Karigakur symbol etched in the top. Bakashi grunted as he leapt off the branch and made his way over to Zabuza, checking the man's pulse. He's dead he mumbled, turning to look at the hunter nin. You're a hunter nin from Kiri? He asked her. Remember, they do not know that Haku is Abusa's partner in crime. Haku bowed. I am, I would like to thank you for stalling him for me. I have been after Zabuza for a long time. The Kashi sighed as he brought his headband back down over his Sharingan. His Genin squad came up behind him, looking at her curiously. The hunter ninja disappeared in a swirl of water reappearing next to Zabuza's fallen body. Bending down the hunter ninja picked up Zabuza, pulling the man's arm over her shoulder. She looked back at Kakashi and the others. Now if you'll excuse me, this body has many secrets, so I need to go and destroy it. Good day to you all. Haku nodded her head at them before disappearing in another swirl of water. Satsuki frowned, getting the feeling she was missing something here. She widened her eyes as she heard Tazuna shout. Oh my god. Tazuna shouted as Kakashi fell face first onto the ground, his one visible eye closed. Sakura rushed over to him and put her fingers on his neck, checking his pulse. She sighed in relief and looked at her teammates. He's alive, just unconscious. Signs indicate chakra exhaustion. She explained to them. Sakura took out a portable stretcher from her bag. Naruto created two clones who laid Kakashi down onto the stretcher and started carrying it. Naruto looked at Tazuna. Hey old man, we need to get to your home now, so that Kakashi-sensei could rest properly. Think you can lead us there? Naruto asked the super expert bridge builder. Tazuna nodded. Yeah sure, it's just this way, follow me. Tazuna replied. Naruto looked at Satsuki. Satsuki, you take point. I'll take the rear. Satsuki nodded before doing what she was told. The three Kanohe Genin followed Tazuna as he led them to his house with the two clones carrying the unconscious Jonin following close behind. After the battle, the group arrived at Tazuna's house. Tazuna's house was a decent-sized two-story house that was sitting on a dock just a little over the ocean. Tazuna knocked on the front door. It's me Tsunami, open up. He shouted. They heard footsteps behind the door approaching them before the door opened. The woman who opened the door was Tsunami, Tazuna's daughter. Tsunami has long dark blue colored hair. She wears a short-sleeved pink shirt with the end of the sleeves and the collar being red in color. She also wears a long blue skirt. Dad. Thank goodness you're all right. Tsunami smiled in relief at seeing her father. Tazuna had a relieved smile on his face when he saw his daughter. Of course I'm all right. It's all thanks to them. Tazuna pointed at Team 7. Tsunami looked at where Tazuna was pointing at. Thank you very much. She thanked the team with a bow. She stood up straight. Uh, are those triplets? Tsunami wondered when she laid eyes on Naruto and his two shadow clones. She then laid eyes on the unconscious Kakashi. Oh my. Is he alright? Tsunami asked. Sakura nodded. He's gonna be fine. He just has a bad case of chakra exhaustion. Speaking of exhaustion, is there anywhere we can let him rest? Sakura asked Tsunami. Of course. I'll show you to the bedroom where you can put him in. Tsunami replied as she stepped aside to let the group enter the house. Naruto and his teammates followed Tsunami into an empty room. Tsunami opened the closet which was the only furniture in the room, and took out a futon. Here you are. Tsunami said as she laid out the futon onto the ground. Thanks. The Naruto clone replied with a smile on his face before setting Kakashi down onto the futon. After that was done, he and the other clone dispelled with Tsunami looking on with surprise on her face. Shadow clones, they're just solid copies of myself, it's a ninja thing. Naruto explained. Tsunami nodded as Sakura sat down next to their sensei. Are you going to be alright sensei? She asked Kakashi who has woken up some time in the past few minutes. Yeah. I just won't be able to move for a week or so, Kakashi replied weakly. Naruto hummed as entered thinking pose. It's because of the Sharingan. 
You aren't in a chiha so it puts a great deal of stress on your body, since it's not built to harness the Kekei Genkai's full potential. Satsuki whispered. Naruto opened his mouth to ask the most important question at the moment. So what do we do now? Before you answer that sensei, was that a hunter nin that killed Zabuza? Satsuki asked Kakashi who nodded. Yes, that is a hunter nin from Kiri. Why do you ask, Satsuki? Can you give me a brief explanation about hunter nins? Satsuki asked. Kakashi wasn't sure about Satsuki's reasons for asking these questions she should already know, but shrugged and answered anyway. Sure, no harm in that. Hunter Nin Corps also known as the Corpse Processing Team, is a special team within Karigakur's Anbu, consisting of Hunter Nin which are given the specific duty of hunting down missing Nin. They completely erase the person they're searching for by means of their superior assassination techniques and medical skills. They could be seen wearing standard armored Anbu uniform or, in some instances a blue kimono with a striped turtle-necked undershirt. They may also wear a mask with thin slitted eye hole, and a wavy design in place of the mouth, and their village symbol on the forehead. Their masks have human resemblances, rather than the typical animal resemblance most Anbu masks possess. They kill their target, taking the head as proof, and then completely dispose of the body by using various methods, such as cremation or the summoning of wild carrion crows, to devour the corpse. This is done in order to make sure the village secrets which a ninja's body holds such as chakra types, herbs eaten, ninjutsu, special medicine, and kekei genkai, will not be revealed to outsiders. Hunter nin are supposed to destroy the corpse at the very spot the body is lying, it is not to be moved after it is dead, and only the head is taken back to prove that the missing nin is in fact dead. As a requirement, they must possess a thorough and intimate knowledge of human anatomy. Due to their reputation for utterly and completely obliterating the remains of their targets, they are code-named, the Undertaker Squad. Kakashi explained to Satsuki who nodded after hearing everything. That Hunter Nin didn't burn Zabuza's body right on the spot though, instead she left with the body. She also used Senbin to kill him, and it didn't look like she was carrying any kind of heavy equipment that could decapitate a person Satsuki started talking. It's odd that a hunter nin would be so ill-equipped to deal with the disposing of a body, don't you think sensei? Satsuki asked Kakashi who nodded back, proud that she was able to figure all of that out. You're absolutely right, Satsuki. I've been wondering about that myself. And I have a theory, most likely Zabuza is alive. Kakashi whispered, making the three gen and white in their eyes in shock. Tazuna who was sitting nearby while drinking a bottle of beer, spat it back into the bottle, and started coughing violently after hearing Kakashi's words. Think about it, the hunter nin used Senbin to kill Zabuza. But unless it hits a vital organ, the probability of actually killing someone is low. It's an item used by doctors in acupuncture. And like I said just now, they have thorough knowledge and understanding of the human body, so putting people in momentary death states is easy as pie for them. Let's look at the facts. First, he carried away the body of the much heavier Zabuza. Second, he used a weapon that has a low probability of killing. Kakashi recounted the facts. Naruto sighed and rubbed his face. So he's alive then, the next question we should be asking is how long would it take for him to be back at 100%. Naruto wondered. Hey hey, aren't you guys overthinking a little bit? From what I heard from you guys, they're supposed to kill missing Nin right? Tazuna asked with concern in his voice. He was concerned that a strong opponent might return. One of the shinobi rules is to always prepare for the worst possible scenario. And even if Zabuza is dead, it just means that Gato is likely to hire an even stronger ninja. We need to prepare, is what I'm saying. But what can we do, Sensei? We only managed to actually injure him because we got lucky in catching him off guard with Naruto's plan. Zabuza would definitely be expecting that when he comes back. Sakura asked Kakashi who chuckled in return. Well, you guys would be doing some training. Obviously this is just training for you guys to get better, and even if I train you, you won't be able to best Zabuza without me. Kakashi replied. Sakura hummed. That's the best possible option right now. He's more injured than you, and he was also put in a momentary death state, so his body should take a while to recover. So yeah, we'll train until then. Just give us something we can work on and we'll be off. Sakura looked at Kakashi determinedly. Why do you guys even bother? Everyone looked at the newcomer, Inari who is the son of Tsunami and the grandson of Tazuna. 
Inari has spiky black hair and dark colored eyes. He wore a green jumpsuit with a yellow shirt and a simple pair of sandals. He also wore a blue and white striped hat under the brim, of which he would usually look at people. Oh. Inari my boy where were you? Tazuna grinned while holding out his arms. Inari ran over to him and gave him a hug. Welcome back grandpa. Inari muttered before glaring at the Konoha shinobi. Tsunami smiled at her son. Inari, say hello to these people. They are the ninja who protected grandpa. Tsunami requested. But mom, they're just going to die. Inari replied, Sakura had an offended expression on her face, while Satsuki glared at the boy. Man, I never thought I'd see the day where someone's more emo than you, Satsuki. Naruto teased Satsuki who scowled and punched him on the arm, making Sakura giggle at Naruto's tease. Listen here kid, Gato ain't got shit on us. Money will only get him so far. There is no way some rich idiotic midget ass bastard is gonna kill us. What is gonna do, bribe us to death. When Gato tries to to get your grandpa, I'm going to beat his ass back to the age of the Sage of Six Paths. Naruto grinned as he held out his fist to Denari. I'm a superhero who will one day become the Hokage. Beto is nothing against me believe it Naruto declared. What are you, stupid? There's no such thing as a hero. If you don't want to die, you should leave this country. Inari warned before he turned around and made his way to the door. Inari, where are you going? Tsunami asked her son in a worried voice. I'm going to look at the ocean. Inari said and left, but not before slamming the door shut on his way out. I'm sorry about that. Tazuna apologized in a depressed voice as he looked over at the Kanoha shinobi. Naruto sighed and shook his head. It's fine, I've dealt with worse. Naruto looked at Satsuki and grinned at her slyly, making Satsuki punch him in the arm again. But that kid seriously needs to get his shit together. Anyone who has that kind of mindset will only stay in the dark forever. The blonde shook his head as he got up. Anyway, I think I'll be going to get some rest. In that case, there are a few extra rooms for you on the right if you want to take one of them. Tsunami said helpfully. Thanks. Naruto smiled at her before leaving Kakashi's room and moved to one of the rooms Tsunami said was open. As he passed by Inari's room he heard crying. Getting curious, Naruto stopped and channeled some chakra to his ear to hear what was going on inside the room. Father Naruto frowned as he heard Inari sobbing and whispering. He sighed and shook his head as he walked away. It was the next day, Naruto, Sakura and Satsuki followed Kakashi who was using crutches to walk. They arrived in front of a lake. Kakashi turned around to look at the three. Alright, our training starts here. You are going to be learning the technique of walking on water. Kakashi revealed while pointing at the lake. Naruto, Sakura and Satsuki looked at him seriously, waiting for an explanation that Kakashi gave the second later. To do this, you have to be emitting a constant stream of chakra from the bottom of your feet and use the repellent force to walk across the water's surface. Obviously this is much harder than the tree climbing exercise, because the amount of chakra that needs to be emitted changes constantly. The more you train in this technique, you will eventually reach a state where you will stand on water without even noticing it or basically even trying. But do not be deterred from my words and your failures. I went through this exercise too when I was younger, and I can't even count the amount of times I fell into the water before eventually getting it right. Kakashi advised them. Naruto grinned broadly at Kakashi. You got it, sensei by the time you're back to 100%, we'll be running on water like it's nothing believe it Naruto declared. Kakashi nodded. I will. And before I go, I suggest you three take off your clothes except for your undergarments, obviously, you don't want to ruin your shinobi attires now do you? Huh? To the ground looking good you too. Naruto whistled at Sakura and Satsuki who were wearing a bikinis while he showed off the top half of his body and had a pair of orange shorts on him. Sakura is an A cup, while Satsuki's a B. Naruto thought to himself while maintaining a smug expression. The reason why he was able to tell was because of him reading too much Icha Icha novels. There was this one part in the novel where Jiraiya of the Sanin, the author of the adult novels, teaches you how to measure a woman's busy size just by looking at them once. Naruto learned it, and he was now a bust measuring pro. But Naruto won't be an open pervert, he can be a pervert somewhere else. For example under the sheets. Th thanks, you all look g good too. Sakura whose blush was as bright as her hair, stuttered back while staring at Naruto's six-pack intensely. 
Satsuki had a crimson blush on her face as she was also staring at Naruto's torso. Her blush was as bright as the color of her Sharingan. Damn, those abs are kinda hot. You two were hiding that all this time. Naruto whispered while looking at Satsuki's and Sakura's toned stomach. Oh boy. Watch what you say, idiot. I'll K kick your balls. Satsuki threatened, but it wasn't really that much of a threat, since she was flustered about Naruto's comment, she is a girl after all. L let's get started everyone. We're wasting daylight here. Sakura suggested. Naruto chuckled before nodding. Alright. Let's do this. It was afternoon and Team 7 did not make that much progress. No one was mad about it, as their lack of progress was to be expected. But Sakura was ahead of Satsuki and Naruto. She was the one who had the least of amount of chakra out of the three of them. Currently, they were taking a break. Sakura was writing down something on her journal. It was apparently her training plan. Since she does have a lot of chakra, she plans to increase it by working on chakra control exercises, but going for endurance, rather than simply learning the exercise. Satsuki was having a small snack while she was watching Naruto training with a group of 30 shadow clones on the water walking exercise. They were still in their bickiness. He's lucky he has chakra reserves of a biju. Satsuki grumbled. Sakura giggled as she stayed focused on writing in her journal. Well he did promise to teach it to us when we have enough chakra for it. Sakura replied to her. Satsuki huffed. Yeah, but how long will it be? It could probably take years to create our first shadow clone. Satsuki mumbled. Sakura shook her head. You should probably go through endurance training in the chakra control exercises like I am right now. It helps a bunch since Kakashi Sensei told me about it. My chakra reserves went from the size of a pool to the size of a lake in a matter of months. Sakura explained. Satsuki nodded. Share the training plan with me, Sakura. Will do, just let me add in the finishing touches go it. HN. You're welcome Satsuki. Who said you could slack off? Kakashi asked them in an amused tone while walking slowly towards them. Sakura and Satsuki looked at him. Ah sensei. Don't worry, we're just taking a small break. Sakura assured him. Kakashi raised an eyebrow at them. Really Sakura? This is your excuse for watching Naruto? Kakashi asked her as Sakura blushed. He then looked at Satsuki. What about you Satsuki? What's your excuse for slacking off? As Sakura said, we're just taking a break. We've been at it for hours now. Satsuki explained simply. Uh-huh, sure. Kakashi mumbled as Satsuki scowled at him. So what do you guys like about Naruto? Kakashi suddenly asked after a while of silence. Sakura was surprised by his question, and so was Satsuki although she didn't show it. Sakura smiled a little as she figured out her answers to his question. The first one is gonna be a little weird, but I like the way he calls me. The way he just says Sakura-chan. Just lifts my mood whenever I feel down. Sakura answered as she looked at the Satsuki who blushed at her sudden gaze. What? Satsuki asked her. Sakura smiled and pointed at her. Let's take turns talking about what we like about Naruto. How about that? Sakura suggested. Satsuki huffed. There's not a lot I like about the idiot. He's loud, he's reckless which makes things a lot harder for us than it should be, and worst of all, he is aware of his faults, and sometimes he acts strong to mask his embarrassment and frustration about them. Satsuki stated with no mercy, making Sakura sweat drop and Kakashi chuckle at her words. Satsuki suddenly smiled a little. But I like that he builds meaningful relationships that he lacks when he was younger through acts of kindness. He was there when I was in my weakest points in my life. I kind of regret rejecting his proposal for friendship between us when he asked me the first time. Satsuki muttered. My turn now, what I like about Naruto is that he knows how to take care of himself and his house. He isn't like most guys who rely on girls to do the cleaning. It's because he grew up all alone Sakura, when you're alone you tend to mature faster than kids your age. Kakashi added. Sakura nodded, already knowing that. I like that he's hardworking. The effort he puts into certain things is unmatchable. Satsuki commented as she looked at the real Naruto who fell into the water, while his clones were laughing at his misery. Yeah. Aside from Ino Pig, he's my best friend that's for sure. Sakura whispered with a warm smile on her face. Satsuki silently agreed. Kakashi smiled at the girls. These three are more like family than just teammates. 
Kakashi commented before shaking those thoughts off. Well, I think that's enough discussion about you guys crush. Go back to training. Kakashi ordered. With a flustered blush on their faces after hearing Kakashi's words, they got up and headed towards the lake to join Naruto in training. Later that night the Konoha ninja were sitting at the dinner table with Tazuna and his family. Naruto, Satsuki and Sakura were shoving food down their throats, not caring about table manners, as they were hungry from all of the intense training they did. Kakashi much to the displeasure of Tsunami, was reading his adult novel right in front of her, even Inari. Naruto secretly still had clones training outside. Sakura. Since you seem to be much farther than your teammates, I was hoping you could go with Tazuna-san tomorrow. Kakashi requested. Sakura nodded. Sure thing, Sensei. Sakura looked at Tazuna seriously. Don't worry, Tazuna-san, I'll protect you with my life if it comes down to it. Sakura promised. Tazuna chuckled and nodded back, no longer doubting them after seeing her and her teammates' performance during the fight with Zabuza. Everyone continued eating for a little while longer, until Sakura noticed something about the picture hanging on the wall behind Tazuna. Tazuna-san, what's with that picture on the wall over there? It looks like a piece of it is missing. Sakura commented while pointing at the picture of Tazuna and his family. The three family members tensed at the mention of the picture. An air of sorrow seemed to fill the air. It's my husband Kaisa Tsunami replied after several minutes of tense silence, her voice sounding a little choked up. The man they called the hero of the land of waves. Tazuna added in a solemn tone. Inari suddenly stood up after hearing that and ran up the stairs. Inari. Tsunami called out for her son, but it was too late. She looked back at her father. Father. I've already told you, don't talk about Kaisa in front of Inari. Tsunami scolded Tazuna who shrugged nonchalantly. What's wrong with Inari? Sakura asked, feeling a little sad for causing such obvious pain to someone else. He lost someone didn't he? That man was very important to him right? Naruto asked. Kakashi hummed as he shut his adult novel. There seems to be a story behind this, care to explain? Kakashi asked, getting interested too. Tazuna sighed as he began to tell his tale. It was about three years ago, after saving Inari from drowning, he taught the boy everything he knew about life, stressing that he must protect the things that were precious to him, saying to always do so with these two arms. He eventually married Tsunami and became Inari's stepfather as well as role model. When Gato tried to take over the land of waves, Kaiza tried to stop him. But Gato decided to use Kaiza to intimidate anyone who hoped to stand against him. To do this, he had his bodyguards cut off Kaiza's arms, mocking his statement of protecting the things you love with both arms, and then executed him in public, traumatizing Inari, who was watching the execution. From that day, Inari changed as did Tsunami and the whole city. Hazuna ended his tale while clenching his fists tightly. Naruto was listening to this calmly. He suddenly got up, gathering everyone's attention. He slowly walked towards the exit of Tazuna's house. Naruto, don't try to act strong again because that's not gonna work on me. Satsuki warned him. Naruto looked back at her with a confident smirk on his face. Sorry Satsuki, but I need to get some more training in. Otherwise I won't be able to prove to Inari that heroes still do exist. The next day, Naruto was sleeping on the ground. A bird was standing on his forehead protector, while two more were standing on his body. While he was sleeping, he had created a group of clones working on perfecting his water walking, and he created another to be working on perfecting several basic tojutsu stances, so that he could merge them to create his own unique style. Not far away from him, there was a woman picking up flowers and herbs before putting them into a basket. That woman was Haku and she was wearing a completely different outfit. She wore her long hair loosely, and wore a pink sleeveless kimono, with pale red edges and decorated with small plum-colored swirls, that went to her ankles. Around her waist was a simple white obi tied in a bow, and she wore a pair of light brown sandals with dark straps. She also wore a dark-colored choker around her neck. A bird landed on Haku's shoulder as she smiled at it. Chu she kissed the bird gently before it chirped happily and flew away from her. Haku giggled before noticing Naruto. Oh. She widened her eyes, remembering who he was when she was observing Zabuza fighting Team 7, while waiting for her chance to fool them. He's the one who stabs Zabuza-san. Her breath hitched, wondering what should be done. 
This was her chance to get rid of him, so that Sabuza could have an easier time dealing with the rest of the Konoha shinobi. She walked towards Naruto silently before kneeling beside him. The blonde had tears in his clothing, showing off the blonde's muscular figure underneath. His figure surprised Haku who gulped. He's even more muscular than Zabuza-san. What kind of training did he put himself through? She wondered before reaching her hand to the blonde's throat. The boy was a hindrance to Zabuza's plan. The best option would be to remove him before he could cause a problem. Suddenly, Naruto grabbed Haku's hand, making her widen her eyes in shock. How? I didn't even make a sound. She thought as Naruto slowly opened his eyes and rubbed them. The answer to her question was that Naruto has an enhanced sense of smell and hearing, which was even better than the Inuzuka clan due to the Kaiubi. Naruto groaned as he looked at her. Haku quickly put up a fake smile. Sorry for scaring you like this, but you'll catch a cold if you sleep out here. Haku explained. Naruto grunted as he sat up and got a good look at Haku. Hey, are you an angel? Naruto asked while rubbing his sleepy eyes. Haku blushed at being called an angel. I'm afraid not. If I was, you would have to be dead in order for us to meet. Haku replied. Naruto blinked as his vision cleared up. He looked away from her and yawned loudly. He turned back to look at Haku who was smiling kindly at him. Naruto was instantly attracted to her smile. He blushed a bit while staring into her large dark brown eyes, I'm sorry miss. A slip of the tongue. He apologized, unsure what to say next to the angel in front of him. Haku giggled a bit, that's perfectly alright. Though, you should be more careful, if you stay out here all night long you may catch a cold and die. Then you really would be seeing angels. She advised him. Naruto hummed. I bet they aren't as beautiful as you though. He commented, but this time it was not a slip of the tongue. His words made Haku blush again. Naruto then raised an eyebrow at her. What about you? What are you doing out here? It's dangerous you know, there's wild animals and everything. Naruto asked her. Haku smiled and lifted the basket she was holding. I'm picking some herbs for my friend who got injured a while ago. I'm gathering these to help in his recovery. My name is Haku by the way. She explained to him. Naruto grinned at her as he stood up. Well I'm Yuzumaki Naruto and I think you're really kind, Haku. Do you need any help picking them? Just point them out and I'll go get them. Naruto offered his assistance. Haku nodded. That would be nice. She replied as Naruto created a shadow clone. Haku looked at him curiously. It's a shadow clone. Ninja stuff. Naruto explained nonchalantly. Haku nodded at the explanation and, feeling this would be an opportunity to gain some insight into Zabuza's enemies, the fake hunter decided to start a conversation. So you're a ninja? Naruto grinned and nodded at her question. Yeah. What gave it away? Naruto replied enthusiastically. Your headband, that and the clone you just made. You're pretty incredible, becoming a shinobi at such a young age. Why did you decide to become a shinobi? Haku asked him. Naruto paused as he grabbed a herb. He shook his head and pulled it out while thinking of an answer at the same time. I became a shinobi so that I could gain the respect of my village through my actions. I plan on becoming the greatest hokage to ever exist in the elemental nations, Naruto declared confidently. Haku raised an eyebrow as Naruto jumped to his feet and pumped his fists into the air. I see that's quite a grand dream so what's a ninja doing out this early in the morning? Haku continued to ask. Training. He answered enthusiastically. After all, destroying several hundred copies of oneself counts as training, right? Haku noticed the obvious lie but let it slide. So why are you training? She asked him. To become strong to protect my precious people and to become Hokage. Believe it he declared confidently. You seem pretty strong now. Nah, my current strength is not enough for me to become Hokage. I want to become the greatest after all. Are you doing this for someone else? Or yourself? Haku asked. Naruto sat down and thought for it. Uh was the only reply he could give her while scratching the back of his head. Haku noticed his confused look and covered a hand to her mouth as she released a giggle. Hey. What's so funny? Naruto asked while having an embarrassed blush on his face. Haku smiled at him. Oh nothing. So do you have someone who is important to you? When a person has something important to protect, that's when they become truly strong. Haku asked him while remembering the days Abusa had come and gave her a purpose. Naruto smiled. 
I know exactly what you mean. Naruto replied to her, remembering the precious people in his life. They were all people who he had grown close to. He would easily fight to protect them, even give his life. You'll get strong, I can tell. Haku muttered before standing up. She smiled at him. By the way, I'm a boy. Haku suddenly revealed with a smile on her face, making Naruto freeze in his spot. Naruto felt like he wanted to vomit. Oh fuck 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 I just called a boy, and Angel Naruto widened his eyes as he picked up Haku's scent as she was walking away. Hey. You're lying. Naruto shouted at her. Haku froze and looked back at him. Naruto walked towards her with a grin on his face. You almost had me there Haku, there is no way you can be a guy. Unless you're a guy at heart. Naruto whispered the last sentence to himself as Haku remained calm and raised an eyebrow at him. Oh. What makes you say that? First of all, you don't have an Adam's apple like I do. Naruto stated, knowing that was one of the difference between the body of a male and female. Second, you're far too pretty to be a man. Naruto grinned, making Haku blush at his compliment. And finally, no self-respecting man would ever smell like flowers. Naruto added. I see Haku whispered, too surprised that Naruto called her out that quickly. A part of her mind was trying to come up with an excuse for posing as a boy. Maybe this is a stretch, but I'm assuming you're posing as a boy because of Gato. Naruto asked, Haku nodded at him, relaxing as the blonde unknowingly gave her a cover story. Yes, Gato's men have been known to do things that were less than savory to women that they catch alone. Haku explained. Naruto nodded. Yeah I could imagine that trash who already works for a scumbag like Gato, would do things like that. Naruto then pointed at himself before grinning broadly at her. I know. Why don't I escort you home? That way if any of Gato's goons even try to touch you, I'll beat the shit out of them. Naruto offered. Haku giggled at the blonde's kindness but grew worried as she tried to find a way out of this situation. That's okay, please do not concern yourself with me. I have been evading Gato's men in the morning ever since he came here. Haku replied, making Naruto slump down as he got rejected. He perked up again after a few seconds. Looking up he saw Haku walking away again. Wait. He called out as he ran to catch up with her. Yes. Haku asked as she turned around, wondering what the blonde-haired shinobi would want this time. Um well if it isn't too much of a problem I want wondering if I could you know. Maybe see you again tomorrow, Haku bit her lip as she was presented with this new dilemma. On the one hand this would be a good opportunity to learn more about Zabuza's enemy. On the other hand, she would be playing with a young boy's heart, someone who for some odd reason reminded her of herself. However, her desire to help Zabuza overrode her desire to keep the young blonde from being heartbroken. I can do that. What time would you like me to meet you? Haku asked him as her stomach churned a bit. How about 7 o'clock tomorrow morning? Naruto suggested with a smile, relieved that she had not turned him down. Okay, I'll meet you here tomorrow at 7. See you tomorrow. Haku gave him a small bow. Before she left, she gave Naruto a warm smile. Her smile sent an arrow that had a heart at the tip through his heart. When Haku was gone, Naruto sighed to himself before realizing something. Wait, why does she have a lot of chakra? Afternoon congrats you three. Kakashi congratulated the genin as they were standing on water. He then gave them a nice smile. Now run on it until walking on water is second nature to you. The next day, 6.30 am Haku put on her yukata after she finished taking a shower, this time not wearing the chest bindings she had worn to conceal herself with. She looked in the mirror for a moment as she grabbed her brush and began to comb her hair. Why am I doing this? She asked herself. Not going to see Naruto, her mind was clear on that. Zabuza had always told her to know thy enemy to allow for an easier victory, though she was sure he was just quoting from someone else. The man may be a skilled shinobi, but he was nowhere near intelligent enough to come up with a saying like that. Why am I getting so dressed up? Haku wondered. She often took care of her appearance, as evidenced by the clear skin and silky black hair. But she had never before bothered to truly comb her hair, other than the necessary time she needed to get knots out. She also had never worn makeup before. It was something she was now wearing, though it was really just a hint of lipstick that she had found in her bag for the times she had to go somewhere in disguise to gather information for Zabuza when he asked her to. Realizing that thinking about it wasn't going to help, Haku finished brushing her hair before standing up and leaving her room. 
Naruto was doing upside down sit-ups with his legs on the tree branch. Naruto. Naruto looked at Haku who approached him with a smile on her face. He smiled and stopped channeling chakra to his legs. He did a flip before landing on the ground. Hey Haku-chan. How are you doing Naruto widened his eyes as he noticed that Haku's chest was bigger than yesterday. That was expected because Haku wasn't wearing her chest bindings today. That's easily C cup. Almost D2. He calculated in his mind. Haku noticed where he was looking at and covered her chest with an embarrassed blush on her face. Naruto it's embarrassing when you look at me like that, Haku whispered shyly. Naruto immediately slapped himself. I'm sorry. Naruto bowed deeply at her while he had a completely flustered expression on her face. Haku giggled as her embarrassment faded a little. It's okay Naruto, I kinda expected that reaction from you. I usually wear chest bindings to hide them. Haku replied as Naruto stood up straight. He grinned sheepishly at her. So how are you doing? Naruto asked her. Haku covered her mouth as she giggled at Naruto's strange behavior. I'm doing well, thank you. And what about you, did you sleep well? Yeah it was great. It was definitely a thousand times better than sleeping outside here, that's for sure. Naruto replied before taking out a containment scroll. He channeled some chakra to it, there was a small puff of smoke as the contents were unsealed. Haku saw a container of steaming breakfast, pancakes, bacon and a pitcher of orange juice, all of it laid out over a blanket. Breakfast. Haku asked him in surprise. She did not expect him to do something this heartwarming. It make her heart beat faster for some odd reason. Naruto nodded and smiled at her. Since I asked you out here, it would be proper to make you something to eat. He explained as the shadow clones he created set down the blanket and the food on it. Haku found herself having a small blush on her cheeks. Thank you. She muttered while smiling as she sat down. No problem, Haku-chan. Naruto grinned at her, handing her a plate as he put some food on it. Haku accepted the plate and watched as Naruto dished himself some food as well. She looked at the food for a few moments, definitely not ruling out the possibility of the food being poisoned. There was a great chance that her food was poisoned. However, she did not think Naruto was the kind of person to do that. There was also no way he could know who she was, he seemed far too kind-hearted to use such an underhanded tactic. Why the hesitation? It's not poisoned. Naruto thought, getting suspicious about her behavior. First she has chakra that only Jonin could have, and now she was staring at his food like it stunk of poison even though it didn't. You okay, Haku-chan? Is it bad? Naruto asked her. He hoped it wasn't bad, but maybe his clone's cooking skills hadn't passed over to him. Huh? Oh no. I was just thinking about something. She picked up her fork and began eating. It's good. She said before she continued eating. Naruto grinned happily at her words. They started talking with each other. Somehow someway, they started talking about what food is the best in the world. Naruto of course said that Raymond was the best. He made the argument that it was the food of the gods. Raymond is the gift that Kami has bestowed upon man, in order to grant us unworthy mortals a small taste of heaven before we die. A, hey, sushi's better. Haku replied with a shrug. Naruto gasped at her. Blasphemy. You think that rotten fish is better than the gift Kami gave us, Haku glared at him. Sushi is not rotten Naruto. And it is definitely far better than those disgusting and unhealthy noodles you eat. It also doesn't make me short. Haku smirked at him. Hey. I'm not short. I'm considered tall for my age, Naruto shouted at her, making her giggle before she outright laughed out loud. Naruto scowled a bit as Haku lay on her back and held her stomach, trying to regain her breath. It's not funny. Naruto grumbled as he pulled Haku back up. Haku giggled some more, struggling to gain control of her emotions. I I'm, SR, she asked him. Yep. They're the first three people who became precious to me. Naruto frowned a little. I'm not well liked in my village. For some reason, people hate me for no reason. They were some of the first people to look at me like I wasn't some kind of monster. They gave me free food when I didn't have enough money to buy them. Naruto whispered, deciding to not tell her of the Kaiubi being sealed in him. Haku's ears perked up when she heard that, as well as catching the hurt in his tone. Haku looked at the blonde next to her wide-eyed. The tone of his voice, the way it sounded so helpless. It was the exact same tone she herself had before Zabuza found her. 
It was then she realized why this boy had reminded her so much of herself. She should have realized it sooner, which was why she was currently berating herself for not doing so. She looked into his eyes and saw the same pain she herself had felt before she was given a purpose. The pain of loneliness, the feeling of having people hate you for something beyond your control. The blonde had the same eyes that she had. That was when Haku told him everything about her past. Haku was born in a small, snowy village in the land of water, a land that had suffered from war not long before. In this war, different sides battled each other using ninja, some of whom possessed Kekei Genkai. After the war ended, memories of the horrific battles still lingered in the minds of the people. Those with Kekei Genkai quickly became feared and hated for their abilities, out of concern that their existence would only bring about more war. Haku's father and mother were simple farmers, and they lived a peaceful life. They loved each other, and were kind to their child. Unfortunately, this would all change. Haku's mother was a wielder of a Kekei Genkai. Ice release. She hid this fact from her husband, hoping that the love and peace that was shared in their small family would last forever. One day, Haku discovered the ability to manipulate water. Amazed by this, Haku proudly showed this to her mother, who was horrified by what she saw. She harshly scolded and slapped Haku for displaying her ability, though she tearfully apologized to her immediately afterwards. Unbeknownst to them, Haku's father had seen everything from the shadows. When Haku's father discovered that his wife and child possessed a Kekei Genkai, he assembled a small mob of villagers. With tears flowing down his eyes, he killed his wife. After that he had tried to kill me, and I I was forced to kill my own father and the rest of the mob that was with him. In my panic I had accidentally activated my Kekei Genkai, and used it to kill them. After that I ran I ended up living on the street, scavenging for food from the trash cans every day, coming a little closer to death, until I wanted to die I Haku had became a sobbing mess as she hugged Naruto tightly, not wanting to let go of him. For several minutes Naruto was too shocked to do anything other than lay there, his eyes widened to the size of dinner plates. He did not expect all of that coming from such a gentle girl like her. One thing is for certain, Naruto is 100% sure that Haku is Abusa's partner. It was the sixth day, today is an rest day for Team 7. Naruto decided he wanted some fresh air because chances are Zabuza will be fully recovered tomorrow, and Naruto needed to meet Haku one last time before the storm happens. Kakashi let him go without asking too much, but Satsuki and Sakura were suspicious of Naruto's new secretive behavior, but they won't ask Kai about it just yet, chances are it might ruin the mission success rate. I'll be fine, and even if I'm late I'll just tell Zabuza about the black cat that crossed my path, forcing me to take the long way around. I'm sure he'll understand. Naruto joked as his teammate sighed while Kakashi chuckled, proud of his student's new ability to come up with excuses. Kakashi gave him an eye smile. Perhaps Naruto, but I don't think he would get the joke like I would. Whatever. Naruto waved at Kakashi before he left. Walking into the clearing Naruto saw Haku was already there. Haku-chan. Naruto greeted her with a smile as he walked up to the beautiful dark-haired girl. Haku gave Naruto a smile of her own as she gave him a now customary hug. It's good to see you Naruto-kun. She whispered as she snuggled onto his chest. Naruto grinned as he broke the hug that Haku was reluctant to. You make it sound like we haven't seen each other in years, Hakuchan. Naruto commented. Haku just gave him a sad smile, something that Naruto noticed but ignored as he grabbed her by the hand and led her to one of the trees. Naruto leaned against a tree while Haku sat in between his legs, leaning her head against his chest. This had been something that they had started doing on their third meeting. It had been amusing when Haku had first began snuggling into the blonde, who had felt his face about to burst, something that she had found extremely amusing. Though after the first 15 minutes of blushing, stuttering and trying not to pass out from the feeling of having a beautiful young woman pressed against him, the whiskered blonde had gotten used to and come to enjoy the cuddling they did. Naruto wrapped his arms around her waist, pulling her as close as possible, without making her uncomfortable as he put his head on hers. He took in a deep breath as Haku scent filled him, letting out a sigh as he nuzzled deeper into her hair, causing Haku to giggle a bit. They stayed like that for nearly half an hour before Naruto broke the comfortable silence. Haku-chan, you work for Zabuza don't you? Don't worry, I don't care if you do. Naruto whispered as he felt Haku stiffen in his arms. 
Knowing Naruto enough to realize that he was not the type to lie to her, Haku relaxed a little. Yes I do how did you figure it out? She asked curiously. Naruto shrugged. The moment you told me about your past. You have a Keke Genkai, large amounts of chakra, and you were picking herbs for a friend. It wasn't that hard really. Naruto explained. Despite being surprised that Naruto had known for this long and not done anything against her, Haku nodded. Maybe she shouldn't be so surprised because she had known Naruto was her enemy from the moment they met and had done nothing against him. How is he by the way? He's fully healed. Haku sighed after answering his question. Naruto frowned. You'll be attacking the bridge tomorrow then. Yes, Haku quietly whispered her answer. I wish you wouldn't you know. I don't want to fight you. He whispered. Haku buried herself even deeper into Naruto, her head nuzzling into the blonde's neck. I know are you angry? She asked while trying not to let her sadness get to her. Naruto shook his head. No, I know you can't help it. Zabuza is your precious person, I know I can't stop you. He replied. Having spent as much time as he had with Haku, her ideals had been permanently imprinted and taken into his own ideals, namely her beliefs on true strength coming from protecting those who are precious to you. And I know I can't stop you from fighting too, they are your precious people too. Just as you are. Naruto corrected her with a genuine smile on his face, making her blush at his words. Haku bit her lower lip as a few tears spilled from her. You're going to make it that much harder for me to fight you, sorry Haku-chan am I precious to you as well. Of course it was at this moment, Naruto made his decision. Haku, I have something important to tell you. Naruto whispered, making Haku look at him. Haku looked at him for a moment and saw the hesitation in his eyes. She smiled as she began gently ruffling his blonde hair. What do you want to tell me? She asked. Taking a deep breath Naruto began to tell her something, something that he had not even told Satsuki and Sakura about yet. The day I was born, the Bijuu known as Kaiubi attacked my village, the next day, wh what is this? Tazuna shouted as he the mist was covered in a thick fog. So much so that the only thing visible beside the bridge were the bloody bodies on it, thankfully they were still alive. Tazuna ran over to one of them who was conscious and lifted the man up, what happened Ed? The M monster the man choked out before passing out from blood loss. Kakashi narrowed his eyes as the mist thickens. Here they come, defensive formation. Kakashi commanded. Kakashi and the three genin pulled out their weapons and surrounded Tazuna. The mist became so thick they could not see more than 10 feet in front of them. Sensei's abuses hidden mist jutsu. Sakura whispered while gritting through Zabuza's intense killing intent. Long time no see, Kakashi. So you're still with those brats. What a surprise, they're doing better than before. Perhaps I should fix that. They heard Zabuza's voice through the thick mist. After he said this 18 of Zabuza's water clones appeared around the group. All of them holding the broadsword attached to their back. Let's go. Naruto muttered as he and his teammates disappeared using the body flicker jutsu. PSSSHHH. The three disappeared in a burst of speed, reappearing at their original position several seconds later, as all the water clones dispersed. It's a tie. Each of us got six. Naruto whispered before looking at Zabuza with a savage grin on his face. Hey no eyebrows. Think you can make another one for the tiebreaker. Naruto shouted at Zabuza who appeared in the mist. TCH. Cheeky brat. My how you brats have grown, it's a good thing I've got my backup with me. Zabuza revealed as Haku appeared beside him on cue. I take it you want the blonde brat, Haku, Zabuza muttered while looking at her. Yes, Zabuza-san. She replied silently. You're too soft Haku. Haku did not reply to his comment as she stepped forward and prepared to face Naruto in combat. I got the hunter nin, sensei. Naruto muttered. Kakashi looked at him before nodding. Good luck. Kakashi replied before running off into the mist to face Zabuza on his own. Unlike Kakashi, Naruto calmly walked away from Tazuna and his teammates, moving several meters away from them to start the battle. Haku followed him, stopping when they were unable to see the others. Naruto-kun, don't, Haku-chan. We both knew this was going to happen, I don't regret meeting you, even if this battle was inevitable. Naruto replied while shaking his head. I feel the same. She whispered while looking at the ground. Hey, do you think you can take off your mask? I want to see that pretty face of yours even if we're supposed to be enemies. 
Naruto requested with a smile on his face. Ever the charmer, Naruto-kun. Haku whispered before taking off the mask and throwing it away, revealing her tear-stained but still smiling face. Haku-chan. If you cry I'll cry too, and then I'll be considered a hypocrite for calling Inari a crybaby a few days ago. Naruto muttered. Haku made a sound between a laugh and a sob. Sorry. She apologized before wiping her eyes. Naruto shook his head. Don't be, I'm barely holding myself back too. You've got nothing to be sorry about, it actually makes me feel kind of special, knowing you can cry for me even though we have to fight each other. Naruto muttered before flipping his tri-pronged kunai into a reverse grip. Then I'm glad I can do this for you at least I suppose we should start, Haku whispered sadly. Naruto closed his eyes. Yeah. He opened his eyes again before he and Haku charged towards each other. Clang. Naruto's kunai clashed against Haku Zenbin. The battle of the bridge has begun. Naruto and Haku continued to clash against each other, using their speed to move around and dodge each other's attacks. Naruto would come in with a powerful and unpredictable combination with his shadow clones assisting him, while Haku would use her speed to dodge or redirect all of the attacks. Haku was aiming for Naruto's vital points, intending to finish him with off quickly, however Naruto was more than up to the task of fending them off with reflexes he had gained from fighting Guy and Kakashi. The two seemed to be evenly matched at the moment. Haku had an advantage over speed and more experience. Naruto was stronger, had an unpredictable style that Haku couldn't follow, and better reflexes overall. The battle looked almost like a beautiful dance, the only sign that it was deadly were the even number of bruises on the pair's faces and the tears on their clothes. The two then jumped back at the same time. It had only been two minutes. You're really good, Haku-chan. Thanks, I learned from the best. Naruto widened his eyes a little as his clones he created to guard Tazuna's house just dispelled. Haku took his distraction to send a kick at him, something the blonde barely dodged in time. It seems your midget of an employer sent some of his goons to try and capture Inari and Tsunami. Naruto commented as Haku frowned hearing his words. That wasn't part of the plan. What is he thinking? Haku thought to herself before she started to get serious. She started performing one-handed hand seals, something that surprised Naruto who had never seen it before. Secret Jutsu. A thousand needles of death Haku created a thousand long water needles from the nearby water that surrounded Naruto from all sides. Before the needles could kill him, Naruto used the body flicker jutsu to dodge and reappear behind Haku. He attempted to kick her, but Haku swatted his leg away and sticking several senbin needles into some of his joints. Naruto hissed at the pain he felt before jumping back. He pulled one out of his kneecap as it started healing on its own. Suddenly, Satsuki appeared beside him. Need some help? She asked him. Naruto looked at Haku who shrugged in response. Yeah, start us off please. Naruto whispered. Fire style. Phoenix flower jutsu. Tsutsuki shouted as she spat out a giant fireball that split into a volley of small fireballs. Controlling each individual flame with her chakra, Tsutsuki guided the fireballs at Haku who barely dodged then all due to Tsutsuki guiding it. But Tsutsuki wasn't done yet, there was shuriken hiding in the flames. Satsuki smirked and did a small hand movement. It was revealed that the shuriken had wire attached to them as they were pulled towards Haku, who used the body flicker jutsu to dodge it and charge towards Satsuki at the same time. Naruto appeared in front of her and attempted to stab her with his tri-pronged kunai in his right hand. Haku blocked his attack with her senbin before pushing his right hand to the left, before kicking him in the solar plexus. Naruto grunted at the pain, but he suddenly crouched down. Haku widened her eyes as she was hit in the chest by a chakra-enhanced roundhouse kick from Satsuki, who was behind Naruto this whole time. The kick was powerful enough to send Haku to the ground, and forcing her to roll back. Meanwhile with Sakura, she was the only one left protecting Tazuna. She looked at the super expert bridge builder. Tazuna-san, do you mind if I destroy your bridge a little? Sakura asked nicely. Tazuna shrugged as a response. Sakura performed four hand seals which were Ram, Monkey, Horse and lastly Ram. Stone Clone Jutsu. Sakura expelled Earth from her mouth to form it into several identical clones of herself. Unlike other clones, ones generated by this method do not disappear when struck with sufficient force, but rather break apart. Sakura spotted a group of Gato's thugs approaching their position. 
She narrowed her eyes and took out an explosive kunai from her pouch. With one swift motion, she threw it at the middle of the small group of thugs. A loud explosion followed. Buam. Sakura had just gotten her first few kills in one go. Back with Naruto's fight, he saw Haku get up before staring at him and Satsuki. Naruto blinked as he looked at something that had instantly caught his attention, he looked at her chest. Noticing his distracted state, Haku launched herself at Naruto. She aimed a kick at his head that the blonde was barely able to dodge. However, he could not dodge the next kick that is him in the face, sending him tumbling back. Oi! You idiot! The hell are you doing Satsuki shouted at Naruto who wiped the blood from his already healed lip. It's not wise for a shinobi to be distracted on the battlefield Naruto-kun. Haku commented. Naruto grunted as he wiped away the blood from his already healed lip, sorry Haku-chan, but it's not every day I get to see such a beautiful sight. Haku looked down and noticed that her chest bindings had been ripped up, revealing her mid-sea cup chest, and there was a rip in her battle kimono, exposing the lower part of her left breast. She blushed before looking back up at Naruto. Pervert. She whispered as Naruto grinned. I'm not. I was merely saying it's distracting. Besides, I thought we already established your beauty when we first met Angel. Naruto replied to her. Haku blushed but shook it off as she looked at the blonde with a small smile, only you could say that in the middle of a battle Narutokan. I figured as much. It's just cause I'm awesome like that. Believe it. Naruto grinned savagely at her and gave a careless shrug. Satsuki looked at Naruto and back at Haku. You know her? Satsuki asked Naruto who nodded. Yup, for a week now. Naruto replied, making Satsuki widen her eyes and surprised. She sighed and palmed her face. Only you, Naruto. Only you. She whispered. This is getting us nowhere. Naruto whispered to himself. Haku seemed to be having the same thoughts. Naruto-kun and his friend are truly a strong fighting duo I really don't want to use this, but to help abuse us and I have to. Haku thought before performing more one-handed hand seals. You two really are strong when fighting together. But I'm afraid that means I have to use my secret weapon on you. Secret Jutsu. Crystal Ice Mirrors. Bakashi grinned under his mask as Abusa disappeared back into the mist after a failed attack on Tazuna and Sakura. But the cost of that was a cut on his chest. His Sharingan had been almost useless in the fight, since the mist was blocking his sight. It was also chakra draining too. Kakashi knew that if he didn't finish the fight soon he would be in big trouble. Sakura. Escort Tazuna out of this place. It isn't safe. Kakashi ordered the pink-haired genin. Yes, sensei. Please follow me, Tazuna-san Sakura shouted as she and Tazuna ran away from the half-completed bridge. Kakashi sidestepped the broadsword's Abusa swung at him and plunged his kunai into his neck, only to realize that it was just a water clone of Zabuza's. Kakashi jumped back as the real Zabuza swung his broadsword horizontally at him. They stared at each other for a few seconds. Looks like Haku was right. You rely too much on that Sharingan of yours, and now that it's useless you're next to nothing. I wouldn't be so sure about that, Zabuza. I still have a thousand Jutsus under my arsenal. I just don't want to humiliate you in front of your partner is all. Kakashi quipped back, making Zabuza narrow his eyes at him. Just admit it, Kakashi. Peace made you weak. Zabuza muttered. Kakashi shrugged. Maybe it did, and maybe I have been slacking off on my training recently. But that doesn't mean I can't get stronger. Bring it on. Naruto and Satsuki found themselves surrounded by large mirrors made out of ice. Haku stepped into one of the mirrors, making her reflection appear in all of them. Satsuki cursed as she activated her Sharingan while being back to back with Naruto. Haku brought out Senban. This is the end forgive me Naruto-kun she whispered before all of the Hakus in the ice mirrors disappeared. In a flash, Naruto and Satsuki found themselves being hit by multiple volleys of thrown Senban in their vital points. With the Sharingan, Satsuki found out that they were not thrown at the same time, being maybe several tenths of a second from each other. It still felt like Haku was moving at light speed. Naruto cursed as he pulled them out of his body. Satsuki gritted through the pain as she pulled some of them out. The Hakus disappeared again, and once again the two found dozens of Senban sticking out of their bodies. Naruto spat out blood as he dropped on one knee. Get a hold of yourself, idiot. Release your resistance seals already. Satsuki shouted. The Hakus reappeared in the ice mirrors. Please surrender Naruto-kun. 
I don't want to have to kill you, Haku begged, not bothering to hide her emotions anymore. I'm sorry, but I can't let old man Tazuna and his dream die. I won't give up. Naruto shouted back, wincing as he pulled out more Senbin from his body. Satsuki cursed in her mind as she realized something else. I know why he won't release it. He doesn't want to hurt her. Satsuki though as she looked at Haku. If you won't do it Naruto, then I will. Satsuki whispered to herself as she released her own resistance seals, going full speed. Haku disappeared again and Satsuki prepared to defend herself. Right. She shouted in her mind as she looked to her right and saw several senbin flying at her. She deflected them with her kunai, but grunted as a volley of them pierced her back. The fight continued with Satsuki getting pierced by a lot of senbin, as her Sharingan slowly got used to Haku's immense speed. Soon she could make out her form enough to see the limbs moving. Realizing long-range attacks won't work on her anymore, Haku tried to attack her up close. Satsuki smirked as she threw a kunai at Haku who was right in front of him. Haku was forced to dodge it, slowing her down a little. Satsuki used the chance to hit her. Bang. Satsuki gave Haku a mean uppercut to the chin. Haku grunted and flew up a little before landing back down on the ground. Despite the hit, Haku quickly got up and got back into one of her mirrors. Satsuki figured out how her jutsu worked at the same time. Haku can travel between these mirrors near instantaneously, giving the appearance that she occupies all of them simultaneously. As such, any attacks she makes from these mirrors can overwhelm opponents, seemingly coming from every mirror at once. But she must be low on chakra. And the longer the fight goes she may slow down enough for me to attack her. Satsuki widened her eyes in horror as she felt Haku zoom past her. She turned around and saw a horrifying scene. Naruto who was about to join back in the fight against Haku, was suddenly pierced by her senbin. It was all over his body. He staggered back a little before blood started flowing out of his out mouth. Haku entered another mirror and looked back at Naruto. She zoomed towards Naruto again, preparing to finish the fight once again for all. Shaiik. Naruto raised his head and looked at someone standing in front of him. He was horrified to see Satsuki using herself as a shield to Haku's attack. Satsuki looked back and smiled at him. She suddenly fell back as Naruto found the energy to catch her and lay her down on the ground. Why Naruto whispered. Satsuki's smile widened a little. I don't know my body just moved on its own Satsuki looked at him as she felt the need to close her eyes. She raised her hand and cupped one side of Naruto's cheek. That man my brother. I told myself I wouldn't die until I killed him don't die too, because I I before she could finish her sentence, Satsuki's hand fell onto the ground. Naruto blinked and stared at her. Her eyes were closed and she wasn't responding. She was simply lifeless. Haku watched it all in her ice mirror silently. I'm so sorry Naruto. But I need to help Zabuza san fulfill his dreams. That is my purpose. Haku thought as Naruto looked down. He was angry, he was in denial, he wouldn't accept that Satsuki, his best friend was dead. WH what do I do? Naruto asked himself. There was no reply as there was only silence in the battlefield. Until a deep growling voice in his head answered his question. Destroy everything Naruto's eyes went red. Ah. Natural gasped as he jolted up from his position in the ground. He sat up and looked around him. He noticed that he was in a place that resembles an underground complex with pipes running along the ceiling and various hallways. The floor is also flooded with a shallow layer of water. Where am I? He whispered as he slowly stood up. He looked over himself, and he was shocked to find out that he was uninjured, and that his shinobi attire was in pristine condition. Okay, what the hell is going on? Am I in heaven or something? If so, then it looks ugly as fuck. He grumbled as he started walking through the hallways aimlessly. He found himself in a giant room that spanned endlessly. There was an enormous cage that was separated from the rest of this complex Naruto was in. The bars of the cage are far enough apart for Naruto to walk between them. The cage's doors are secured by a sheet of parchment with seal written on it, behind which is the cage's lock. It was at this moment Naruto realized who was sealed behind the cage. Kaiubi. Naruto whispered to himself while clenching his fists. On cue, two giant eyes opened from behind the cage and glared at Naruto. Naruto narrowed his eyes at them. Its pupil alone was taller than a human. Naruto was looking at crimson red eyes with large slits in them and large sharp pearl white teeth which was scowling at him. 
Naruto slowly approached the cage as he slowly got a good look at the Kaiubi who narrowed his eyes at him. The Kaiubi had red-orange colored kitsune with black fur around its red eyes that stretch up to his ears, and nine long swiping tails. He also had an upper body structure of a human, complete with opposable thumbs on his clawed hands. His size was equal to the size of the Hokage Rock in Konoha. He was lying on the ground with his nine tails swing in the background. Where am I? Naruto asked him. We are in your feeble little mind. I thought you would realize that sooner. The Kaiubi answered with a bored tone. So what's your name? Naruto suddenly asked him, making Kaiubi blink in response. Naruto sat down on the ground, not caring that his pants was getting soaked by the water flooding the floor. I mean, everything has a name. And I'm definitely not calling you Kaiubi every time we meet, it sounds boring. Naruto added. Kaiubi narrowed his eyes at Naruto. I'm not telling you anything, brat. Kaiubi replied to him angrily. Naruto took note that the Kaiubi didn't deny that he had a name. I know what you're here for and I'm not interested in talking with you. I know you're here to ask for my chakra. Kaiubi accused him. Naruto snorted and crossed his arms. Yeah, I'll pass on that. I want to know why you want me to destroy everything. Naruto replied. Kaiubi growled at him. The answer is simple you fool. I am the living embodiment of hatred. Right now, I can sense your hatred towards that ice release girl for killing your precious Achiha teammate. Don't you want to release some of that anger you've been boiling up inside you? Kaiubi asked him while grinning evilly. Naruto glared angrily at him. Say one word about them, and I'll show you how angry I can truly be. Naruto threatened, making the Kaiubi laugh hysterically. Ha 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 you think you, a human can best me, the strongest of the tailed beasts, how delusional can you be? Kaiubi shouted while laughing uncontrollably. Naruto stood up straight and pointed at him. You're not gonna take control of me, I won't let my precious people get hurt, just because you wanna get out of that seal. I won't be dependent on your power, no matter how good it may sound. Naruto then walked up towards Kaiubi who growled loudly at him. Kaiubi then shot part of his sharp claws through the cage, and towards Naruto who didn't flinch as he was face to face with the Kaiubi's giant white claws. The fox was glaring at him, sending shivers down Naruto's spine, but he kept a calm front. You either work with me, or you'll be stuck in that cage forever and trying to escape when I won't allow you to. It's your choice, Kaiubi. Naruto muttered as he and Kaiubi resumed their intense staring match. TCH Kaiubi pulled back his hand and punched the bars of the cage angrily. He looked down at Naruto who slowly held out his fist. I hope this can be the start of a great relationship. Naruto added with a smile on his face. Has he lost his mind? Kaiubi thought before opening his mouth to reply. What are you even saying, Brad? Do you not hate me? I killed your mother, I killed your father. My existence made your life hell. Why do you not hold any hatred towards me? Kaiubi asked, genuinely wanting to know Naruto's reasons for not hating him. Because if it weren't for you being sealed inside me, I wouldn't be strong and independent. I wouldn't have found those who are precious to me. I wouldn't have found those who see me as Naruto Uzumaki, and not as the Kaiubi who destroyed the village. I'm not lying when I say that I hate you. I hate that you destroyed Konoha and killed so many innocent lives, and for what? So that you can show off how powerful you are. Because of you I never felt my father's and mother's love. Because of you I was shunned, because of you I had my growth as a shinobi stunted. Naruto shook his head. But I won't sit and mope about it, I have shit to do other than being depressed all day. Even though I don't know much about my mom and dad, their sacrifice to the village so that I could live means everything to me. I plan to earn the people's respect with my actions. And whether you like it or not, you're in this with me. You're sealed inside me after all. Naruto grinned at him. So let's put aside what we hate about each other and try working together. What do you say? Naruto asked him. Kaiubi stayed silent as he stared down at the blonde in front of him. Kaiubi then held up a finger. Only one tail. Fuuuum. Back in the real world, Naruto's eyes widened as his eyes changed color from bright blue to crimson red, and his pupils become slitted. The senbin that was in his body was blasted away from the shockwave Naruto, created by tapping in Kaiubi's chakra. His nails and canine teeth grow longer and sharper. Naruto's hair also grows longer and spikier, and the whisker-like marks on his cheeks widen and thicken. His wounds healed up in an instant. 
Ha and Naruto breathed out a puff of steam from his mouth. Naruto was surrounded by a layer of red, wispy chakra granting him enhanced strength, speed and healing. Around him, the ground was shaking violently as Haku stared at it in shock. This chakra. It's so evil. Is Naruto-kun using the Kyuubi's chakra Haku thought to herself, already knowing the about Naruto's burden, since he told her about it yesterday. Naruto stood up and turned his head to look at her. Meanwhile, Kakashi and Zabuza widened their eyes as they felt the evil chakra coming from Naruto. Zabuza narrowed his eyes. It's coming from inside Haku's ice mirror's dome, from that blonde-haired brat. So that brat is a Jinchuriki like the fourth Mizukage, huh? This is interesting. Zabuza thought while smirking behind his mask while Kakashi was having other thoughts. No. The seal isn't breaking. The seal is perfectly stable, it almost seems like this was supposed to happen, I'll need to be careful, since I don't know what Naruto will do in this state. Kakashi thought before taking out a scroll. Azuna and Sakura were on their hands and knees, breathing heavily and unable to even move, staying conscious from the feeling of the Kaiubi's power was a challenge. Haku took out more senbens and prepared herself to be attacked by Naruto. Naruto made a tiger hand seal, releasing his resistant seals on his body and gaining more speed. He rushed towards Haku who was stunned at how fast he suddenly was. She threw a volley of senbens at Naruto. Ha Naruto roared as he generated a shockwave from it and sent the senbens flying away. Haku appeared in another ice mirror above Naruto and dove towards him. Naruto did a flip, dodging her attack. Haku attempted to get to the next ice mirror by she was then punched in the gut by Naruto, sending her flying away and crashing through an ice mirror. At the same time, Haku ran out of chakra to maintain the ice mirrors. The ice mirrors had large cracks on them before they shattered into peace. Haku spat out some blood as she slowly stood up to look at Naruto who appeared in front of her in a blur. Naruto who was gritting his teeth, threw a punch at her as Haku just stared at it. Perhaps this is the price I pay for hurting you, Naruto-kun. Haku thought as Naruto's fist inched closer and closer to her. Huh? Haku opened her eyes and looked at Naruto, whose fist was one centimeter away from hitting her in the face. Why why won't you kill me? My purpose is now gone Naruto-kun, Zabuza-san has no need for a broken tool. Kill me. Haku whispered as a tear fell down her cheek. No, you cannot just ask something like that. Why would you even think that I could kill you? What makes you think I could ever kill you? Just fighting you feels like I'm tearing apart pieces of my soul. Naruto shouted. I am nothing more than a tool that has now been broken, Naruto-kun. I can no longer help Zabuza-san fulfill his dreams. Therefore you must shut up, but I killed your friend, Haku shouted. Naruto pointed at Satsuki who was currently getting treated by Sakura. Does she look dead to you? Naruto asked while Sakura was kneeling right beside Satsuki. She had already took out the senbin stuck in the Ichiha's body, now all she needed is to heal her mystical palm technique. She whispered as a small green glow covered Satsuki's numerous stab wounds on her chest. Sakura was applying her hands to a wounded part of the body and sends chakra into it, accelerating Satsuki's natural healing abilities. Naruto pointed at her as his cold glare sent shivers down her spine, his crimson red eyes made it even worse. How dare you say something like that to me Haku-chan? What did all those times we spent together mean? Was that a lie? Are you telling me that you felt nothing when you were with me? That all those times we had spent together meant nothing to you? Were you simply using me to help Zabuza? Naruto asked her, making Haku widen her eyes in shock. No Haku shouted before taking a step forward. How can you think that? Everything I said was true. I loved being with you. Every minute we were together I felt safe and content. I even spent time with you when Zabuza Sama voiced his disapproval. Don't even think that our time together meant nothing. Naruto raised an eyebrow at her. I thought you were a tool, Haku-chan. Tools aren't supposed to feel, especially not for their enemy. And tools aren't supposed to aim for non-vital points that would only knock a person out. Naruto smirked at her, shocking Haku as she had been caught red-handed again. You're not a tool Haku-chan, you're a ninja, but ninja aren't just mindless tools who are used and then thrown away when someone feels they are no longer useful. B but my purpose a person can live for multiple purposes, Haku-chan. You're kind right. Perhaps that could be your other purpose, helping others. Just please let's stop fighting. Naruto muttered as he held out his hand. 
Naruto widened his eyes as he received a memory from his shadow clone. He had created them discreetly so that he could substitute with them if he was caught in a hard spot. Right now, he received some news. News that could definitely stop all of this nonsense once and for all. But first, he had to stop Kakashi from killing Zabuza. A minute before Haku was defeated Kakashi and Zabuza just felt the effects of Naruto tapping into the Kaiubi's chakra. Kakashi pulled out a scroll. Well this has been fun, Zabuza. But let's be honest, we're both busy people, and I'm sure you would like to end this as much as I do. So let's end this. Kakashi wiped some of the blood from his cut chest with his thumb, he unrolled the scroll and spread the blood across it. Zabuza grunted. HMPH. Well that sounds interesting Kakashi. Show me what you can do. He shouted Kakashi closed the scroll and wielded a couple of hand seals, before slamming the scroll on the ground. Summoning. Earth release. Tracking fang technique seals spread out from the point of impact, the ground also began to tear up and move across the landscape, as if there was something moving under the ground. Whatever you're trying Kakashi, it's not going to work. You can't figure out where I am. However, I now know where you are what? Zabuza shouted in shock. Kakashi stood up straight. If eyes and ears don't work then just use your nose. Kakashi muttered as he heard the sound of ground cracking. The mist cleared and showed Zabuza with several dogs latched onto them with their mouths. There was a giant bulldog latched onto his left shoulder, two dogs biting each of his legs, two dogs biting his thighs, one dog attached to his right wrist, another holding his broadsword down by the hole at the end, and lastly, a small pug hanging off his headband. That's what happens when you have your eyes shut in the mist. This summoning is specifically for tracking down an opponent. When you cut me, I let you cut me so that I could get my blood on your weapons. These are my cute little ninja dogs. Their sense of smell exceeds that of all other dogs. You are the one trapped in my jutsu. Kakashi ended his speech before closing his normal eye. The mist has cleared, your future is death, Zabuza. Kakashi declared, making Zabuza scoff. I'm really sick of your I can see the future bullshit, Kakashi. Don't be foolish. Your death is certain. You went too far, your ambitions were too great. You abandoned your country and became a missing ninja, your story even reached Kanoha. Your attempted coup d'etat and your attempt to assassinate the fourth Mizukage failed. You were forced to flee the country and become a missing ninja with what little followers you had. You realized that in order to try again, you would need money, and so you ended up working for scum like Gato. Kakashi began going through several hand seals before putting one head near the ground, the other holding that hand's arm in place. Rikiri. Kakashi declared as lightning crackled violently around his hand. Zabuza felt fear looking at the jutsu. You're too dangerous Zabuza. Tazuna-san, the person you are trying to kill is this country's courage. The bridge he seeks to build is this- I have my own ambitions and ideals to fight for Zabuza shouted while still being held back by the group of dogs. And that's why you will die now, Zabuza. Sorry it's come down to this. Kakashi apologized before dashing towards Zabuza with a trail of bright blue lightning following him. When Kakashi was one step away from piercing Zabuza through the heart, a tri-pronged kunai was thrown his way. Kakashi widened his eyes and dodged it. Suddenly, Naruto appeared beside him while holding the hand that had Rikiri on it. Kakashi looked at him in shock. No sensei. We have more important matters to attend to. Naruto muttered while looking at him seriously. Zabuza-san. Haku shouted as she appeared in front of him, shielding him in the process. Zabuza looked at her. Haku he whispered as he looked at her bloody but serious face. Naruto. What is the meaning of this? Zabuza is the enemy. Kakashi narrowed his eyes at him. Naruto shook his head. No, sensei. He isn't anymore. Look. Naruto muttered while pointing at someone approaching them. He. So what's going on? The shinobi turned to look at the edge of the unfinished bridge to see a short person walking towards them with a large army of thugs behind him. Gato. What are you doing here? Zabuza whispered while glaring at the man. Gato has shaggy brown hair and sports a pair of small, circular black glasses. He wears a black suit with a purple tie, a yellow shirt underneath his coat and closed toot shoes. Look at you Zabuza, all beaten up and getting your ass handed to you by a bunch of brats and a scarecrow. Gato taunted Zabuza while smirking arrogantly. What do you want? Zabuza shouted at him, already angered that he had his fight interrupted. 
Ado grinned, showing that he was savoring this moment. Such a temper's abuser, that's why you still don't have a wife. The plan has changed, I actually planned to do this from the beginning. I'm going to have you and your protege killed today. I never intended to pay you anyways. It's so easy to get rid of you missing ninja, you abandoned your village, and now no one will come after me after I kill you. Hell. I usually get a bonus with your bounty when I hand you over. Gato declared crazily. Zabuza gritted his teeth and clenched his fists tightly. Scumbag indeed. Kakashi whispered. Gato looked at Haku and widened his eyes. Since the bindings on Haku's chest was undone, he noticed that she had a nice rack on her. So she's actually a girl huh, she's quite the looker. On second thought, we'll spare your little bodyguard after we're done with you. Maybe I'll give her over to my boy so they can get some fun in. Bakashi looked at Zabuza who had an enraged expression, while he was making an attempt to escape the dogs holding him back. Let me go, Hadakar fight is over. You win. I have no reason to go after that bridge builder. The same goes for you and your brats. Let me go damn it. I'll kill him. I'll kill for making fun of her and her honor. Bakashi smirked under his mask as he felt the immense killing intent leaking out of the missing nin. He released the jutsu, the dogs disappeared in a puff of smoke. So Zabuza, why don't you be a good little boy, and just surrender Agato widened his eyes in pure terror, as he felt two immeasurable amounts of killing intent directed towards him. Zabuza had a dark aura around him, while also having a shadow covering his eyes. Naruto slowly walked towards him and stood beside him after a couple of steps. He was oozing out killing intent, the layer of evil red chakra was flowing around him violently, even cracking up the ground he was standing on. I'll castrate you for saying that, bastard. Naruto growled as he stared until Gato's eyes with his crimson red ones. Gato peed his pants right then and there. So you do care about her huh? Naruto commented silently. Zabuza side-eyed him. So he's Haku's boyfriend. A Jinchuriki like the fourth Mizukage. Zabuza thought. A shinobi is still a human kid. When you become strong, don't become like an emotionless piece of shit like me. Zabuza advised as he unsheathed his broadsword, Kubikrubjm. Kubikirabacho is a large broadsword, as tall as a full-grown man, shaped like a butcher knife. The blade itself has two cutouts, a circle close to the top, and a semi-circular one nearer to the handle, the former of which is aptly fitting the sword's purpose of decapitation. The latter notch allows a strap to be wrapped around the weapon, making it easier for the user to carry. Its extremely long handle is also detachable to further aid transportation, and then reattached when required for combat. You don't need to tell me that, Kanoha doesn't need an emotionless hokage. Naruto replied with a grin on his face. Thank you. Zabuza suddenly muttered, surprising Naruto and Haku. Zabuza looked at him and gave Naruto an eye smile, though not as pretty as Kakashi's. In all the years I've trained, raised and known her, I have never seen her as happy as she had been this past week, and I know she was like that because of you. This past week you made Haku the happiest than she's ever been, and for that I want to thank you. Zabuza explained. Naruto smirked and nodded back. Well, I'm sure that if you treat her like a daughter and not a tool, she'll be a thousand times more happier. Naruto argued back. Zabuza snorted. Me? A father to her? you sure have a wild imagination. Zabuza commented, making Naruto shrug in response. Zabuza looked at Haku for a moment. Zabuza-san. What is it? Haku asked him. Zabuza shook his head. I'll tell you about it later. For now Zabuza glared back at Gato and his horde of thugs, while his immense killing intent returned full force. Let me deal with those assholes first. Zabuza and Naruto started walking towards Gato and his group of thugs. You don't need to join, I can do this on my own. Zabuza grumbled. You can deal with the other, Gato is mine. Naruto replied seriously. Zabuza stayed silent as the two sped up. Gato gritted his teeth and pointed at the two ninjas. Kill them all. He shouted as the thugs roared before running towards Zabuza and Naruto who started running towards them. Boom. In a burst of speed, Naruto zoomed past Zabuza who growled angrily and sped up, matching his speed. Zabuza swung his broadsword at a thug, splitting him in half. Naruto stabbed one of them in the throat before kicking them away. He and Zabuza started to absolutely massacre the thugs, while Gato watched on in horror. 
Haku turned around to look at the start of the bridge to see the villagers of the Land of Waves, marching towards their positions while holding pitchforks, hammers and knives as weapons. Inari was taking the lead and was the one who rallied the villagers. He was holding a crossbow loaded with a sharp arrow. The young boy's outlook on life had changed after Naruto dragged him to the side and talked with him. He learned to deal with his horrible past like Naruto did. Naruto's unwillingness to quit and concern for others helped Inari to realize the power of will over fate and that no risk is too great to protect something precious. Big bro Naruto. Inari whispered as he looked at Naruto who was killing Gato's thugs left and right. He wondered why Naruto's looked more evil than before. All Gato saw were two demons massacring his army with no intention of handing out mercy. Dead bodies were flying out of the army left and right, while Naruto and Zabuza cleared a way towards Gato. Many had limbs torn off, arms, legs, heads included. Some of the men were even ripped to nothing more than chunks of flesh by Naruto's sharp claws. Naruto wasn't having a problem killing them. He was killing rapists, killers and thugs, not saints. Zabuza was just doing what Zabuza does best, which was killing. It was raining blood as the Konoha Shinobi and Haku watched on. Satsuki sat up with Sakura kneeling beside her to support her. What the hell? Satsuki whispered as she looked at Naruto who was drenched in blood. She looked at his crimson red eyes and thick whisker marks on his cheeks. He better have a good explanation for us. She grumbled. When Zabuza and Naruto killed all of the bandits, they turned their eyes to Gato who was currently curled up into a ball, somehow still conscious despite the overwhelming bloodlust and killing intent coming from the two. PP please SS spare me. Gato begged as Zabuza and Naruto stopped in front of him. I I L G G I V Y U U anything you want. Just let me go. Scumbags like you don't walk out of this world alive. Naruto whispered before kicking Gato in the chin, sending the man flying up to the sky. Zabuza leaped to the air and grabbed Gato by the throat. I should have killed you and stolen your shit when I had the chance. Zabuza growled before putting his hand on the top of Gato's head. And no. P please don't de do this. Beto begged while crying profusely, making Zabuza disgusted. I can and I will. Zabuza growled angrily before ripping Gato's head off his body, spraying blood everywhere, making it rain. Zabuza landed on the ground and looked at the villagers of the Land of Waves. He frowned under his mask. How far have I fallen? These people, they look exactly like the people back in Kiri. And I want thinking of killing them. Zabuza thought before looking at the dead body of Gato he was holding in his hands. Zabuza threw the head and body towards the villagers. The body and decapitated head landed in front of Inari who looked at it. Inari suddenly remembered what Gato did to his father Kaiza. He gritted his teeth angrily and raised his crossbow, shooting an arrow straight through Gato's head. He picked it up and raised it high. We are free, Inari declared with a grin on his face as the villagers cheered loudly. Naruto smirked as he slowly walked back towards Kakashi. Satsuki widened her eyes and immediately got up, ignoring Sakura's warnings about her being physically weak. Naruto suddenly felt weak as he fell forward. It was his first time using the Kaiubi's chakra, it drained him mentally. When he was using it, Naruto needed something to fill in the void of loneliness within their hearts, to give him strength to control the power. Satsuki was just in time as she caught him. She looked at him and smiled a little. Hey, idiot. She greeted him. Naruto smiled back at her and looked at her with his bright blue eyes. Hey, princess. You're a sight to see for sore eyes. Okay, so you're telling me that the fourth Hokage sealed the Kaiubi inside you on the day you were born. Satsuki recounted what Naruto told her while Sakura was bandaging the Ichiha up. Naruto nodded. Yup, that's about it. Naruto replied. Sakura then looked at him. And you're also a part of a clan called the Uzumaki clan. A clan that has godlike talent for Fuinjutsu and got massacred by Kumo, Iwa, Kiri and Suna because they tried to play god. You have one hell of a background story, Naruto. Sakura commented with an amused smile on her face. Naruto laughed sheepishly before scratching his head. I'm just glad you girls don't hate me because I have the Kaiubi sealed in me. Naruto replied, making Satsuki snort. Why would we? There's clearly a difference between you and the Kaiubi. I get why you said that you hate people who can't tell the difference between a kunai and the scroll it sealed into, when we were introducing ourselves to Kakashi-sensei. Satsuki muttered. Naruto's smile widened. Sakura then glared at Naruto. 
You still haven't told us about how you met and kept in contact with your secret girlfriend, Haku. Sakura grumbled with a hint of jealousy in her voice. Naruto's and Haku's relationship was something out of a romance novel. Yeah, you're so lucky she hasn't assassinated you. Satsuki grumbled. Is that jealousy I hear in you girls' voices? You really wish that was you, wasn't it? Naruto teased with a smug smirk on his face. You're just hearing things, idiot. Satsuki shouted with a blush on her face. I prefer a normal relationship, thank you very much. Sakura mumbled with a blush on her face too. Naruto just laughed, making the girls pout at him. Naruto sighed with a smile on his face. So what now? He wondered. We will continue with our mission and guard Tazuna until he finishes building the bridge. Kakashi replied as he entered the room. He gave his team an eye smile. I'm glad to see you three doing well. Kakashi added, prompting them to smile back at him. Kakashi sat down with them. This mission is just one of many more to come. I'm proud of you three, you handled this mission very well. I thought you guys would be scared and forget about your training when we faced those two. Kakashi complimented them. Naruto blushed and grinned at him. Sakura smiled warmly while Satsuki smirked a little. Kakashi hummed softly while rubbing his chin. I think you three are ready for it. Kakashi muttered, gaining confused expressions from the three genins. Kakashi gave them another eye smile. Say, do you three want to join the Chunin exams? It has been one week and a half since the battle on the bridge ended. The bridge was repaired and finished in record time, with the help of Naruto's army of shadow clones, assisting in the manual labor part of the construction project. Kakashi hummed as he wrote something in his journal. It was his own personalized training plan with some advice coming from his students. Seeing how hard his three students were pushing themselves to get stronger, Kakashi felt like he could not stay idle for much longer. While conducting their usual 3v1 sparring sessions with his students, Kakashi had realized how far his skills had slipped as a result of over-reliance on his Sharingan. He decided to set out and correct it. Naruto even offered to create a specific seal for Kakashi. The purpose was simple, to seal Kakashi's Sharingan, but also allowing him to reactivate it by releasing the seal. Naruto also obviously planned for it to be reusable, but he decided to hold off on it in order to perfect his Fuinjutsu skills some more before starting that project. Kakashi wanted to keep riding, but he was approached by somebody. He looked up and we surprised to see Haku wearing a kimono standing in front of him. Hello, Kakashi-san. May I speak with Naruto for a moment? Haku asked him while smiling at the Cyclopean Jonin. Kakashi nodded before entering Tazuna's house, requesting Haku to wait a moment. A minute later, Naruto rushed out of Tazuna's house with an excited grin in his face. He hadn't seen Haku for a week and a half now, so he was pretty eager to say the least. Haku-chan. He greeted her with a smile on his face. Haku smiled back and waved at him. Hello, Naruto-kun. Shall we go? Haku greeted before holding out her hand. Naruto grabbed it before intertwining them. Sure. Where do you want to go? The forest should do just fine. Let's go then. So Haku-chan, how's Ibuza? Naruto asked Haku who was sitting in between his legs. Haku smiled at the mention of Zabuza. He's doing well. And there's something I need to tell you. It's about me and zabuza sans relationship. Haku revealed, gaining Naruto's interest. My name is not just Haku now. It's Mamachi Haku. Haku revealed, shocking Naruto who looked at her with surprise on his face. Haku giggled at his already expected reaction. Wait what? How did that happen? Naruto asked her. Haku smiled as she snuggled into his chest. Well Zabuza s I mean father always wanted to adopt me since he took me in, but just couldn't find the courage to do so, fearing this advancement might scare me. Haku explained. When I said that he needed to treat you more like a daughter, I meant that as a joke. Naruto grumbled, making Haku giggle again. I'm happy that father thinks of me that way from the start. Haku replied as Naruto caressed her hair. So what would you guys be doing now that Gato is gone? Naruto asked her. Haku suddenly became serious. We're going to be joining the resistance in Karigakur. Haku replied. Naruto tilted his head. Resistance? Naruto wondered. He had never heard of this resistance before. Actually, he has never heard anything from Kiri before. Yes. Currently, Kurigakur is in a time of darkness, the worst it has ever seen since the Kekei Genkai Civil Wars. 
The fourth Mizukage, Yugura Karatachi is the cause of all of this madness. He is known for his hand in various crimes, such as exploiting money from the weak, and his zero tolerance against any dissent in the village, reinforcing its nickname as Village of the Bloody Mist. No one was safe under his rule, whoever dared to speak out found themselves and their families, even distant cousins publicly executed. Haku explained, making Naruto frown and shake his head. Many in Kiri believe he is being manipulated, but there's no backing to that hypothesis. But right now they don't have time to sit down and think as the country is in another civil war. Zabuza's father has established contact with the rebellion leader, Mei Terumi. She is an old friend of his while he was back in Kiri's Anbu. Haku added. Can you tell me more about this Yugura guy? Naruto asked her. Haku nodded. Yugura Karatachi is just like you, Naruto. A Jinchiriki. He is the Jinchiriki of the Three Tales. Haku revealed, surprising Naruto. So how did Zabuza lose to him? Naruto asked, wanting to know more. Well, using the power of the Three Tails, Yugura transformed into the beast, and it forced Zabuza to run away. Haku explained simply. What about Mei Terumi? You know anything about her? Not much, but I do know that she has two Keke Genkes, Lava Release and Boil Release. I also know that her bodyguard, Al the Byakugan Killer, has a Hyuga Clan's Byakugan implanted into his right eye socket. Wow, so they're pretty strong huh when are you two leaving for Kiri? Tomorrow we go. Haku answered with a sad expression on her face. Naruto frowned, this will be the last time he'll see Haku for a while. I'll miss you a lot, Haku-chan. He whispered. Haku cupped his face. I'll miss you even more. Our bond is unbreakable, Naruto-kun. And it will be stronger the longer we're away from each other, our love knows no boundaries after all. Haku muttered with a shy smile on her face. Her words surprised Naruto who looked at her with a shocked expression. What chu? Naruto widened his eyes and his face turned crimson in an instant, as Haku pulled him closer and gave him a kiss on the lips. Naruto closed his eyes and kissed back. It was their first kiss for the two of them, so it was sloppy. Naruto liked how soft and smooth Haku's lips were. Her lips were ice cold too. After a few seconds, Haku released the kiss and looked at Naruto. The two blushed vividly and looked away with shy expressions on their faces. Naruto grinned and scratched his head. I don't think I can be away from you now, Haku-chan. Naruto muttered. Haku smiled and stood up. I can't too, Naruto-kun. But we both have our own dreams to accomplish. We should work towards them, and maybe we'll find ourselves crossing paths again during that. Haku replied. Naruto nodded and stood up. You got it, Haku-chan. When you see me again, I'll be even stronger than Zabuza. Believe it. Sensei, I haven't asked you this because there was a lot going on. But how did you get the Sharingan? Satsuki asked Kakashi while Naruto was away with Haku. Kakashi shut his adult novel and put it away. I was waiting for this question for a while now. I got it during the Third Great Ninja War from a late teammate of mine, Abito Ichiha during the battle and destruction of Kanabi Bridge. His sacrifice turned the tide of the war. And that is where my legend as copy ninja Kakashi starts. Kakashi explained. Satsuki looked down. I'm sorry. She whispered. Kakashi waved it off. Don't be. He still lives in me. Kakashi pointed at where his heart was, and then he pointed at his Sharingan. Kakashi Sensei, what was Itachi like when he was in the Anbu with you? Satsuki suddenly asked while clenching her fists tightly. Kakashi wanted surprised at the question. Satsuki hated her brother to an immeasurable level for killing her clan and parents in one night, but here she was trying to know him better. Kakashi shook those thoughts away. If Satsuki wanted to know, who was he to withhold information about her brother? Let's see Itachi was 11 when he joined Team Ro, an elite Anbu unit that serves directly under the Hokage. He was working alongside a Tenzo, a good friend of mine and me as their captain. The next day, Team 7 was gathered at the finished bridge Tazuna built with the combined effort of the villagers and Naruto's shadow clones. Tazuna, Tsunami, and Ari were there. The now all of the people of the Land of Waves were there, not only to celebrate the completion of the bridge, but also to see off the heroes who saved their country. Naruto in particular had been subjected to many looks and whispered mutterings, much different the ones he received in Konoha. Unlike in Konoha where people would call him monster behind his back, or glare at him with hate-filled eyes. The people here were staring at him in awe. 
They also whispered were about how strong he was, and how he, his teammates and his sensei, had freed them from Gato. Thanks for everything you four, it's thanks to you that the bridge is complete man, this is kinda sad that you have to go now. Tazuna mumbled his last sentence. Thank you for everything, Tazuna-san. I'm sorry for leaving like this, but Lord Hokage will want to report on what happened here as soon as possible. Kakashi replied before Naruto grinned at them. Don't worry. We'll come visit someday. Just don't get too lonely without me, you hear, Naruto shouted while looking at Inari who was on the verge of tears. Why you better big bro Inari sobbed out. Naruto smiled down at him. Hey, it's alright to cry if you're happy. Besides, it's only a see you later Inari. I'll be back soon. But you better not be shocked because I'll be back physically and mentally stronger than ever. Believe it. Naruto declared as Inari started crying out loud. I'm not crying. I just have dust in my eyes. Inari lied while wiping his tears that fell down his cheeks. Naruto grinned and patted Inari's head before shaking Tazuna's and Tsunami's hand. I'll see you guys soon. Naruto waved at them. Satsuki nodded at the family of three, while Sakura grinned and cheerfully waved at them. The villagers cheered loudly for them as Team 7 started leaving the Land of Waves. Tazuna smirked as he looked at the back of Naruto walking away from him. That boy changed Inari's heart, and Inari changed the people's heart. He gave us a bridge to hope called courage. He's always yapping about wanting to become Hokage one day. Tazuna's smirk changed into a warm smile. I think he'll do it one day. He whispered before Inari turned towards his grandfather. Hey, Grandpa. We need to name the bridge. Inari reminded him. Tazuna smiled and nodded at him. I already have a super perfect name for it. Oh yeah? What is it? Inari asked excitedly. How about the Great Naruto Bridge? Tazuna said as people began to cheer for the new bridge and the genin who made it all possible. I have a feeling that name is gonna bring this bridge good luck. Who knows, it may even bring other people good luck. And this place will be where his and his team's legend starts, the legend of Team 7, the heroes of the Land of Waves. It all starts here. Zabuza what do you want now? I thought you said you didn't want to fight me anymore. Kakashi asked as he narrowed his eyes at the man standing before him. Zabuza shook his head. Not my idea to come here, it was hers. Zabuza pointed at Haku who glared at him a little for ratting her out. Come on Haku, we don't have any more time to waste. We need to meet Mei on time. Zabuza grumbled as Haku walked towards Naruto. Chu Haku gave a quick peck on Naruto's lips. Naruto's face was instantly as bright as Sakura's hair. He covered his mouth and looked at her with a shocked expression. Haku giggled at his reaction. She smiled warmly at him. Till we meet again, Naruto. Haku waved at him before she and Zabuza disappeared in a blur by using the body flicker jutsu. Tsutsuki and Sakura were staring at him with expressions full of disbelief. Kakashi was giving the blonde a sly look in his visible eye. Damna Team 7 was returning to Konoha by jumping from tree after tree. Since they no longer had any passengers, they were able to put their shinobi skills to good use. So Sensei, what are we gonna do when we're back at Konoha? Sakura asked Kakashi. We make advancements in U3's training. Satsuki wants to learn how to wield a sword, while well, you want to improve on your Jinjutsu and nature transformation skills. Naruto wants to get started on training his wind release, which is his strongest element with water being second, lightning being the third and fire being the fourth. I will send you to separate teachers that specialize in those skills I just mentioned. Who will they be? Satsuki asked curiously. Kakashi gave them an eye smile. Shinobi that specialize in specific shinobi arts. Kakashi replied, making his three students wet drop and groan at their sensei's antics. Suddenly, a hawk flew towards them. Kakashi widened his eyes and held out his arms. His student stopped and stood on tree branches while the hawk perched on Kakashi's shoulder. It's a messenger hawk from Konoha. Kakashi explained while taking the scroll tied to the hawk's leg. He let the hawk fly back to Konoha after petting it. Kakashi then opened the scroll and read the contents in it. He widened his eyes as he read word after word. His concerned students watched on as there was a tense silence around the atmosphere. Kakashi sighed as he closed the scroll. We've been assigned another mission from Lord Third. It's an A-rank mission. Kakashi revealed, shocking his students to the core. 
They rank missions relate to what is in a village or country's personal interests, and are extremely difficult or dangerous to complete, usually assigned to Jonan. A rank missions pay between 150,000 and 1 million Ryo. Another one. Naruto muttered while receiving the mission scroll from Kakashi. The sum it all up, an Anbu patrol squad spotted and sensed two shinobi from Iwagakur crossing our borders chasing someone. Lord Third wants us to go stop them before they get too far in the country to cause a massive incident that could potentially start the next great ninja war. Kakashi explained. Naruto gulped as he read the mission scroll that held some more details about the mission. Sensei, why are they not sending people like Jonin's or Anbu to stop them? Why send us, a genin team? Sakura asked, getting nervous. Satsuki was silent, but she was also tense like everyone else. We're short of hands. Most Jonin's that have genin teams are currently out in Kanoha performing their own seer rank missions. We can't send an Anbu squad or a squad of Jonin mixed with Chunin, because that might send the wrong signals to the Iwagakur shinobi. Kakashi explained. Naruto handed the mission scroll to Satsuki who quickly read through it with her Sharingan. Well we are a first response team. It would make sense that Gramps assign us this mission. Naruto commented. Kakashi shook his head. These days, Team 7's true purpose as a first response team is in name only. This hasn't happened since the Third Great Ninja War. Kakashi muttered. Satsuki deactivated her Sharingan and gave the scroll to Sakura who quickly read through it. Do we have any information about who the two Awagakur shinobi are? Do we also have information about who they're chasing? Satsuki asked him. The Anbu's observations confirmed that the two shinobi were chasing a missing nin from their own village. One of the shinobi is the third Tsuchikage's granddaughter, Kuritsuchi, while the other is the Tsuchikage's shield, Akatsuchi. Kakashi revealed, Sakura almost dropped the scroll she was reading. The Tsuchikage's granddaughter Satsuki gulped. She had never felt this nervous in her life, not since she saw the dead bodies when she entered the Achiha clan compound all those years ago. I think we Kakashi advised while also reminding his students about their C-rank turned A-rank mission they just completed. Are you guys ready? Alright. Let's head out. The journey was tense. It may seem like a small negotiation mission, but it isn't at all. All negotiations in the shinobi world will have two directions, peace or war. The threat of a war starting was on their minds the whole journey. Team 7 landed on a clearing as an Anbu operative landed in front of them. Kakashi looked at the boar masked Anbu member who was standing in front of them. Report, boar. Kakashi commanded as boar nodded back at him. The two Wagakur shinobi are a few miles away, they're chasing the missing nin as we speak. We will provide support if things go wrong, Captain. Boar reported to Kakashi who waved back at him. Hey Boar, I'm told you guys I'm not Team Rose captain anymore. Kakashi replied to him. In our hearts, you will be our captain forever. Boar muttered. Kakashi sighed as Boar used the body flicker jutsu and disappeared in a blur. Let's pick up the pace. Kakashi whispered as he and his students used the body flicker jutsu at the same time. A few miles away there were two Awagakur shinobi chasing someone. Those two were Kuritsuchi and Akatsuchi. You're not gonna get away with this. You will not start a war. Kuritsuchi shouted at the man she was chasing. I'll do whatever I want, Kuritsuchi. The man, named Gantetsu replied. Kuritsuchi gritted her teeth and performed a couple of hand seals. She landed on the ground and looked at her target. Earth style. Falling earth spears she declared as she condensed the mud in the ground. She produced a horde of large spikes that protruded from the ground in order to skewer Gantetsu. Gantetsu gritted his teeth and applied chakra to his legs. He landed on a tree branch before blasting off it, zooming past the spikes that tried to skew him. Earth style. Earth and stone shoots. Kuritsuchi declared after performing more hand seals after her first jutsu. She condensed the soil and rock in the area to sprout out in the form of large spikes that attacked Gantetsu from all four sides, in an attempt to skewer him once again. PSSSHHH. Antetsu was pierced by the spikes. Akatsuchi landed beside Kuritsuchi. He widened his eyes as he looked at what the spikes pierced. It was a wooden log, Gantetsu had used the substitution jutsu. Earth style. Rock bullet jutsu Kuritsuchi and Akatsuchi widened their eyes as two giant rocks flew towards them. They jumped back and dodged the rocks that crashed onto the ground they were previously standing on. They look at Gantetsu who appeared right before them. 
Gantetsu has a head of spiky, dull black hair, thick sideburns and dark colored, squinted eyes. He was wearing the standard attire for Iwa Shinobi, which consisted of a red outfit that had one sleeve a lapel, which is usually found on the side without a sleeve, and a brown flak jacket that had a pouch attached to it. He was also wearing mesh armor around his ankles. We can do this the easy way, Gantetsu. Hand over the scroll that contains information about Iwa's military. Kuritsuchi demanded seriously. Gantetsu scowled at her. Why should I, brat? Gantetsu shouted back. Because I know what you will do with it. You will share it with the neighboring countries, even Konoha. You want to start the fourth great ninja war. I will not allow that. Kuritsuchi shouted back while gritting her teeth. Gantetsu's scowl deepened. You know nothing about my plan. I won't hand it to you even if I'm dead. Gantetsu shouted. Kuritsuchi's angered expression turned into a serious one. Then I'll just have to melt you until there's nothing left of your body to fight back against me. She whispered before performing hand seals with Akatsuchi performing his own set of hand seals. Lava style. Quicklime congealing jutsu earth style. Stone pillar prison poof. Kuritsuchi and Akatsuchi stopped executing their respective jutsu and squinted their eyes as a plume of white smoke suddenly exploded in front of them out of nowhere. The plume of smoke cleared, revealing Team 7 standing in between Gantetsu and the two Iwa Shinobi. Kuritsuchi widened her eyes in shock when she looked at Kakashi. Copy Ninja Kakashi Haddock. What are you doing here? This is a Wagaker's business. Kuritsuchi shouted at him. Kakashi shook his head. When you entered the land of fire's borders, it makes your business Kanoha's business. Now Kuritsuchi-chan and Akatsuchi-san, please retreat back to your own country before you start another great ninja war. Kakashi ordered. Kuritsuchi gritted her teeth and shook her head. Can't do that, unfortunately. We're chasing a missing nin who has stolen information about Iwa's military. Said missing nin intends to share this info with the other great nations to start another great ninja war. That's why we can't let him escape. Kuritsuchi explained. Kakashi narrowed his eyes. Where is he now? Kakashi asked. Kuritsuchi sighed. Well, we were about to deal with him until you and your weight is that your genin squad. Kuritsuchi tilted her head as she looked at Naruto, Satsuki and Sakura, who all donned serious expressions. Yes, these three are my cute little students. Please finish what you were saying. Alright, we were about to deal with him until you and your genin squad came in. He's gone now. Kuritsuchi explained. Kakashi hummed. Sorry for ruining your chance, but it's not too late to go after him. We will have to come with you, you are in our territory after all. So does that mean you're helping? Kuritsuchi asked him with a surprised expression on her. She was expecting Kakashi to chase her and Akatsuchi away. Yes, but if any of you show even a hint of aggression towards me and my students, I'll send you back to Iwa in body bags. Kakashi threatened while leaking a bit of his killing intent. Kuritsuchi gulped before nodding. Why yes, sir. If you were wondering why Kuritsuchi was so willing to work with Kanoha Shinobi out of all people, the answer was simple. They're working together to prevent a great ninja war from happening. The world doesn't need a world war, every single great nation has a shortage of war potential, even Kumo who is still amassing power, and Kuritsuchi would much rather not face Kanoha or Kumo Shinobi. Currently, they were rushing through the forests of Kanoha trying to find Gantetsu. Unfortunately for them, they found no sign of them. And it was getting late so they decided to camp out for the night. There was awkward around the atmosphere as Iwa and Kanoha Shinobi sat around the campfire. Kuritsuchi subtly looked at Kakashi who noticed her stare but didn't say anything. She remembered that Kakashi's sensei, Minato was the one who destroyed Kanabi Bridge and Kusagakur with, cutting off Iwagakur's supply line in its war with Kanoha. Remembering about Minato made her remember about that time where the man single-handedly stopped an invasion consisting of a thousand Iwa Shinobi. His stunning actions made her grandfather, the third Tsuchikage, accept the peace treaty. Remembering about that one-sided battle made her remember about her mother who was killed in it. She then looked at Naruto who was roasting some marshmallows while staring at the fire with a bored expression. He kinda looks like the fourth Hokage with the blonde hair and blue eyes. Kuritsuchi pointed out before opening her mouth to speak to him. What's with those whiskers, blondie? Kuritsuchi asked while pointing at Naruto's three whisker marks on each side of his cheeks. Naruto smiled at her. He got a good look at her. 
Kuritsuchi has short black hair and distinctly pink eyes, which are accentuated by her eyelashes running upwards at the corners. She wears the standard attire of the Iwanin, consisting of a red uniform with her right sleeve missing and a lapel over her right leg, the brown Awagakur flak jacket, fishnet tights and a skirt over them. She also wears regular shinobi sandals and a pair of gloves. I had it since I was born. And it's not Blondie, it's Naruto Uzumaki, future Hokage of Konoha. Naruto declared confidently. Kuritsuchi snorted at Naruto's name. Naruto. Like the swirly fish cake. She asked with an amused smirk on her face. Naruto blushed in embarrassment before scowling at her. It means maelstrom, damn it. Naruto grumbled while crossing his arms, making Kuritsuchi giggle. You know, your name reminds me about a guy in a novel I read a week ago. It's called The Tale of the Utterly Gutsy Shinobi, written by Jiraiya of the Sanin. Kuritsuchi revealed. Kakashi tilted his head at the mention of Jiraiya's name. I've never heard of that book before. When was it released? Kakashi asked her. Kuritsuchi shook her head. It stopped being sold at bookstores a long while ago. The book sold poorly, and nobody attended the book signing. I'm lucky enough to have it. Kuritsuchi explained. What's it about? Naruto asked, getting interested about it. The story follows the adventures of a ninja named Naruto that vows to free the world from a cycle of hatred. Naruto never gives up and vows to break the curse, which represents the cycles of war, conflict, and hatred that occupies the ninja world. Kuritsuchi explained to him. That sounds like a fun book to read. Can I borrow it for a while? Naruto asked, making Kuritsuchi laugh loudly. Kakashi was very amused by Naruto's question. How the hell am I gonna do that, Naruto? I live in Iwa and you in Konoha. And I don't think Iwa will allow Konoha Shinobi to enter. Sorry. Kuritsuchi smiled wryly at Naruto's disappointed expression. Nah, it's alright. Maybe there's a few copies left, I'll try to find them so that I won't need to ask you to borrow it to me anymore. Believe it. Naruto suddenly brightened up and grinned broadly at Kuritsuchi, surprising her and Akatsuchi at how fast he can change his emotions. Whatever you say, Blondie. Kuritsuchi smiled at him as Naruto got angry again at his nickname. It's not Blondie goddammit. It's Naruto the next morning, the Konoha and Iwa Shinobi quickly ate breakfast and cleaned up the camp they made before continuing on their chase after the missing nin. Naruto had sent a group of shadow clones to scout ahead for the man. Kuritsuchi was surprised when he used the jutsu. She thought it was supposed to be chakra taxing, so how was the blonde able to create five of them and still keep going like he never lost an ounce of his chakra? She shrugged it off and set off with Akatsuchi by her side and the Kanoha shinobi jumping from tree to tree alongside them. Naruto widened his eyes as he received memories from his shadow clones. He processed them and looked at Kakashi Sensei. Sensei. He's hiding in a cave not far from here. The clones dispelled before he could find out about us, so we still have the element of surprise on our side. Naruto reported. Kakashi nodded. Well done, Naruto. Are you all ready? Kakashi asked the Iwa Shinobi, Sakura and Satsuki. All of them nodded back at him with serious expressions on their faces. Naruto raised his hand. I got a plan. Fire style. Fireball Jutsu Gantetsu widened his eyes as he looked at a large fireball that came out of nowhere heading his way. He jumped back to avoid getting killed by the fireball. While he was in the middle of jumping back, Sakura suddenly appeared behind him and slammed her hands onto the ground after forming the necessary hand seals for her Jutsu. Earth-style barrier she declared and created a solid wall that rose up from the ground. Gantetsu cursed as he slammed the back of his body into the wall Sakura created. He looked at the fireball inching closer and closer to him. Sakura disappeared using the body flicker jutsu to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. Boom. A giant explosion happened with the solid wall Sakura created crumbling down from the fireball attack. The Konoha and Iwa Shinobi landed on the ground. Naruto noticed the small chunks of bark on the ground and immediately deduced that Gantetsu used the substitution jutsu. He closed his eyes and used his chakra pulse technique, he sent a pulse of chakra in all directions. Over there. Naruto who sensed Gantetsu's chakra with a technique, pointed at a bush. Earth style. Rising rock jutsu. Two huge rocks flew out of the bush and crashed into Kakashi, sending him flying away into the forest. Shit. Naruto cursed as Gantetsu leaped towards him with a psychotic grin on his face. 
The blonde Jinchuriki took out his tri-pronged kunai and created multiple shadow clones around him. Gantetsu started dealing with the clones easily. He then set his sights on the real Naruto and took out a kunai from his pouches before charging towards him. Shik. Naruto gasped as he was stabbed in the stomach by Gantetsu's kunai. Strangely, no one reacted to this with shocked and horrified expressions. Akatsuchi appeared beside Gantetsu and Naruto. He quickly formed a snake hand seal before slamming his hands onto the ground. Earth style. Earth dome jutsu. Instantly, Earth rose from the ground and formed a dome that covered Akatsuchi, Gantetsu and Naruto with it. Gantetsu widened his eyes as Naruto grabbed his hand tightly, and his body started glowing. The blonde pulled his shirt away a little, revealing that his body was covered in exploding tags. Just before Naruto exploded, Akatsuchi quickly sunk into the earth using earth style. Hidden mold jutsu. Naruto grinned menacingly at Gantetsu. Boom. Boom. The shinobi outside needed to shield their faces from the rocks and dust flying towards them. Smoke covered the battlefield for a while before it cleared on its own. The real Naruto received the memories of his shadow clone that acted as a suicide bomber. It was an interesting memory to process to say the least. He looked at Gantetsu who was leaning his body against a tree. His right arm that held the kunai to stab the suicide bomber shadow clone was blown into bits and pieces. His chest had small chunks of it missing, and his mesh armor was non-existent. Gantetsu coughed out blood and looked at Naruto. He's supposed to be a jonin. Naruto wondered to himself. It was at that moment that he realized that strategy could really change the whole course of the battle. Give up now Gantetsu, and maybe I'll give you a quick death. Kuritsuchi said while walking towards him. Gantetsu looked up at her. He gritted his teeth angrily and roared loudly. With his left hand, he took out a kunai and lunged towards the eye with Jonin. Die goddammit he screamed as Kuritsuchi looked at him with a shocked expression. Suddenly, Kakashi jumped in between them and grabbed Gantetsu's left wrist with his left hand. He looked at the missing nin with his visible eye with a bored expression on his face. Lightning style. Electromagnetic murder. A-H-H-H. Antetsu screamed in agony as Kakashi created a wave of electricity from his left hand. The surge of electricity shocked Gantetsu, making him spasm uncontrollably. Kuritsuchi appeared behind the spasming Gantetsu with a menacing expression on her face. Earth style. Stone fist jutsu. She muttered as her right arm was encased in rock. She punched straight through Gantetsu's chest, killing him instantly. She pulled her fist out as the dead Gantetsu fell onto the ground lifelessly. Kuritsuchi checked his body and took out a scroll that was in Gantetsu's pouch. She read the contents of the scroll. She looked back at Akatsuchi and the Kanoha Shinobi with a smirk on her face. Mission success. So I guess this is goodbye for now then. Naruto muttered to Kuritsuchi while they were standing at the edge of a mountain, overlooking a large forest that was surrounded by flowing rivers. Yeah, this was one hell of an experience. I never thought I'd be working together with Kanoha Shinobi. Kuritsuchi replied with an amused smile on her face. Naruto grinned broadly and turned to face her. Hey Kuritsuchi. When I become Hokage, I'll make sure to go to Iwa to pay you a visit. Believe it. Naruto declared. Kuritsuchi crossed her arms. HMPH. You have a long way to go, Naruto. Strength and intelligence wise. Strength isn't the only thing you need when you want to become a cage. Kuritsuchi reminded. Naruto nodded. Got it. Naruto then smirked and held out his fist. Kuritsuchi looked at it and raised an eyebrow. What are you doing? She asked him. Naruto's smirk widened. A fist bump before we part ways. Naruto explained. Kuritsuchi smirked and raised her fist. Sure. They fist bumped. A few days later. It was late in the afternoon that Team 7 trudged through the gates of Kanoha. The trip back to Kanoha was full of discussion about their respective training plans. Ah, Kakashi-san. Kakashi looked at Kitetsu Hagen who was the one greetings him. Kitetsu is a guard to the front gates of the village, along with his best friend, Izumo. Kitetsu has long, spiky, black hair and dark eyes. He has a strip of bandage running across the bridge of his nose and a light-colored marking on his chin. He wears the standard attire of a Kanoha Shinobi, complete with a forehead protector and a flak jacket. I see that you and your team have returned. I trust that the mission went well. Kitetsu asked him. 
Kakashi nodded back while showing his and his three students identification papers. It went as well as it can be expected for my team's first time out of Konoha. They sure do know how to handle themselves, that's for sure. Kakashi replied with a hint of proudness in his voice, making his student smile a little. Izumo Kamizuki who sat next to Katetsu nodded at Kakashi's words. I remember my first time out of Konoha, not quite the experience I had expected as a genin. Izumo commented. Izumo has brown hair and dark eyes. His hair is combed down and always covers his right eye. He wears his forehead protector like a bandana, along with a standard Konoha Shinobi outfit, which goes all the way up to his chin and a flak jacket. Katetsu snickered. That's because your dumb is sat on poison ivy. He teased. Shut the hell up man. Would you bring that up in front of the kids? Izumo grumbled with a small blush on his face. I had to. You sat in poison ivy, and then you had to have a specialized ointment for your ass. Kakashi sighed and ignored Izumo and Katetsu who started bickering while his student sweat drop at what was happening. He turned around and looked at his team. Alright kids, let's go report to Lord Third about our missions. Hehehe <laughs> Harazin laughed perversely as he was reading Itcha Itcha Paradise, while sitting on the couch that was below the four full body pictures of the four Hokages in Kanoha. Over at his desk were two cage bunchens diligently working on the paperwork that he had. He really needed to thank Kakashi for telling him about this. The boy was hailed as a prodigy for a reason. Knock knock knock. Come in. Hirazin grumbled as his secretary entered the room. Hirazin looked at her with a small smile on his face. Lord Third, Team Seven has arrived back at Kanoha and have come to see you. She reported with a small smile on her face. Hirazin sighed as he shut the adult novel and put it on his desk. Send them in please. He addressed while he sat down in his chair and dispelled his clones doing the paperwork. His secretary pushed up her glasses before exiting his office. Team 7 entered the office second later. Hirazin looked at Kakashi who had an unreadable expression. He looked at Naruto who had a small smile on his face, Satsuki had a stoic expression, while Sakura was looking at Hirazin with respect. Hirazin smiled. Kakashi, Naruto, Satsuki and Sakura. Welcome back to Konoha, it is good to see you two back from your mission. I have read the report about the Land of Waves mission you sent me, Kakashi. But I need to want to hear more from you. Hirazin requested. Kakashi shut his adult novel and started recounting what happened during his team's Land of Waves mission. Naruto, Satsuki and Sakura were also involved in the report, describing what happened in their own perspectives. Hirazin listened to it with a serious expression. So Gato is dead and his criminal empire gone. Zabuza and his now adopted daughter Mamachi Haku has now headed to Kiri to join the rebellion which is the Keke Genkai side against the fourth Mizukage's tyrannical rule. And now the Land of Waves is a potential trading partner with Konoha and possibly the world. Hirazin summarized the whole story. Kakashi nodded. Yes Lord Hokage. Kakashi confirmed. Hirazin hummed. The world is changing rapidly. If we do not adapt to its changes, we're as good as dead. Hirazin muttered as he puffed out smoke from his smoking pipe. To think that such a thing could happen on a mission that was supposed to be a simple C rank. This is what we get when we have a bad case of misinformation, both from our client and apparently our network outside of the village. Still to hear that a squad of genin were able to complete a mission that was easily air ranked is astounding to say the least, even if the jonin with them was a ninja of Kakashi's caliber. And they also completed another air rank mission on their way back flawlessly too. If they were to join the Chunin exams happening in the next month and a half, I think no one would dare to argue with Kakashi's decision. Hirazin nodded before looking back up at Team 7. Congratulations you four. You have done a great service to Konoha and will be rewarded accordingly. Hirazin snapped his fingers as an Anbu operative wearing a rabbit mask appeared out of nowhere. Rabbit handed Hirazin eight envelopes filled with Ryo before he disappeared in a blur. Hirazin handed two envelopes to each member of Team 7. This is the payment for completing two air rank missions. 300,000 Ryo for the Land of Waves mission, while 700,000 Ryo for the Iowa one. Hirazin explained as Naruto's eyes widened. He needed to safe keep it instantly. Sakura gulped while staring at the envelope which Satsuki remained stoic. Thank you Lord Third. Sakura bowed at Hirazin who chuckled and waved at her. No need for that Sakura. 
You and your teammates deserved it for having such a great performance out there. Harazin replied. Kakashi nodded as he out the two envelopes in his hand away. You all are dismissed. Harazin said as Kakashi, Satsuki and Sakura started walking towards the exit. Hey Naruto. What's wrong? Didn't you say you want to go to Ichiraku Raymond? Satsuki asked Naruto who stayed still on his spot. Naruto looked at her. Don't worry. You guys go there first, I'll catch up. I need to talk with Gramps for a moment. The blonde replied. Satsuki nodded before exiting the office, closing the door behind her. Hiruzen looked at Naruto curiously as the blonde-haired Jinchiriki sat down in front of him. Reading Naruto's expression, Hiruzen understood that Naruto wanted this to be private. He held up a hand, the Anbu who were hiding in the corner of the room appeared and then walked out of the door. Hiruzen used some chakra to activate the silencing seal that Minato had created when he had been Hokage. There was a soft glow that filled the room for a second before going back to normal. You already know from Kakashi Sensei's report that I used the Kaiubi's chakra. Naruto mumbled as the old Hokage nodded. I take it you want to tell me the details. Hiruzen guessed. He guessed correctly as Naruto nodded back at him. Yeah, when I used his chakra for a few minutes, I was in full control. Naruto replied, shocking Hiruzen who looked at him with a baffled expression. You were in full control that whole time? Hiruzen asked, not believing what he was hearing. Naruto nodded. MHM. Somehow I managed to convince the Kaiubi to cooperate with me. He said he will allow me to have full control over one tail's worth of his chakra. Naruto explained as Hiruzen was even more surprised. It was unheard of, the Kaiubi cooperating with a human. Even Kashina who was the Jinchiriki of the Kaiubi before Naruto, tried to convince him to work together with her, but she ended up failing miserably in the end. This is an impressive achievement, Naruto. Congratulations. It seems that Minato's judgment was correct. Hiruzen muttered, confusing Naruto with his words. What do you mean by that Gramps? I'm not sure, but perhaps Minato thought you would make some kind of deal with him, or perhaps he thought you would be able to subdue him. But what I do know that he felt you would be able to use its chakra to protect the people you love. Wow Naruto whispered, the fourth had put so much trust in him when he was just a child. It would be an insult if he didn't make him proud. Also Gramps, I finished reading those few Injutsu books you gave me. Mind giving me some more? Of course, of course. Here you go, Naruto. Be careful as one wrong step could mean the end of your life. You got it Gramps see you soon. Goodbye Naruto. Naruto started whistling a small cheerful tune while he was walking towards training ground 10. Kakashi assigned him to be trained in elemental manipulation by Asuma, the Jonin sensei of Team 10 which Shikamaru, Ino and Choji were a part of. He found them in the training ground training. Ino and Choji were running laps around the training ground, while Shikamaru and Asuma were sitting under a large tree with a shogi board in between them. The two would move pieces back and forth, Shikamaru would take a piece, and Asuma would look at the board in frustration. You lose again, Sensei. It's 50-0 now. The Nara smirked at Asuma who sighed with a smile on his face. Ugh. I want to eat chips, Choji groaned as he fell onto the ground, feeling pain all over his body. Ino was feeling exhausted while barely able to stand up beside Choji. Stop complaining I can't let Sakura surpass me, Ino wheezed out. Her body gave up as she fell forward. She found herself landing on something that was rock solid. But something was Naruto who let Ino lean on him, while his shadow clones were carrying Choji to where Shikamaru and Asuma were. Hey there, Ino. Naruto grinned broadly at Ino who blushed and got flustered at the position they were in. H hey and Naruto Ino whispered weakly. Normally she would have tried to beat the shit out of the blonde for doing something like this, but she was too exhausted to do so. And his body was pretty comfortable to lean on so that did the trick. Huh? Oh, Naruto. Shikamaru gave a lazy wave to Naruto who waves back at him. Asuma's gloomy expression disappeared as he looked at the blonde Jinchiriki. Ah oh, Naruto, you're finally here. I was beginning to think that Kakashi's habit of being late to everything had an effect on you. Asuma smirked at Naruto who laughed. Nah, but I do know how to give excuses like him if I was ever late though. Naruto replied, his words making Asuma chuckle. Naruto looked down at Ino and wrapped his arm under her butt. Kaya. Ino squealed in shock as Naruto used one hand to carry her towards where her team was. Asuma raised an eyebrow at Naruto's actions. 
Naruto placed Ino against the tree and sat down. Ino looked at him with a flustered expression, while having a vivid blush on her face. He took out a piece of chakra paper as everyone looked at it curiously. Naruto channeled his chakra into the paper. Instantly, the paper shredded into multiple small pieces before becoming damp. After that, the small pieces wrinkled and burned into dust. Wind, water, lightning and fire release. All are strong, but wind is the strongest if the torn paper was any indication. Asuma muttered before lighting up a cigarette. You're the only wind element user in Konoha Asuma-sensei, so I was hoping you would have some advice. Naruto muttered as Asuma took a deep puff of his cigarette. I was already gonna do that alright, let's get started. Asuma nodded and took out something from his pouch. It was a trench knife. Asuma's style of combat specializes in the use of chakra blades. These are uniquely designed trench knives worn like brass knuckles, with a zigzag-shaped blade to give them teeth. He often uses them to augment his tojutsu skills. The blades are made of a unique metal that can be imbued with the user's chakra nature, and can act as an origin of their techniques. The chakra blade is a type of weapon that a user can flow their chakra into, giving the weapon additional properties. Holding it up, Asuma channeled wind chakra into the trench knife, creating a green glow that surrounded the blade. When I channel my wind chakra, I often think of it as two sharp edges rubbing against each other, in order to create a sharp razor blade. Asuma explained before throwing the knife at a tree. Naruto looked on in awe as the knife shot through the tree cleanly before shooting through a giant rock behind it. The knife came out of the rock and embedded itself to the ground. Asuma smirked and looked at Naruto. First, you need to start learning the leaf cutting exercise. The trick is to make the two edges as close as possible to create a sharp blade of wind that can cut through the leaf. Naruto nodded at Asuma explanation before going over to pick up the trench knife. He arrived back where Asuma and his team were at before sitting down, examining the weapon. This is excellent quality, is the metal chakra conducive? Naruto asked the jonin. It is. Asuma replied while taking another puff of his cigarette. Naruto sighed as he took out his tri-pronged kunai and looked at it. Man, I wish this was a chakra blade like yours. Naruto mumbled. Asuma had a grimace when he looked at the tri-pronged kunai. This brings back memories. Dad, you're gonna give the whole world, especially Iwa and Kumo Shinobi PTSD with these things. Asuma thought before shaking his head. Don't be down, Naruto. Chakra blades only allow you to channel chakra into whatever weapon you wield easier. It's actually much better to channel your elemental or normal chakra into these weapons, since it technically proves that you have more skill than those who use chakra blades. So why do you use it? Naruto asked him. Asuma shrugged. I got it from the fire daimyo for free. I would be stupid if I don't use it. Asuma replied simply. Shikamaru was listening to this silently while his eyebrows were furrowing. Damn, Naruto is moving into elemental manipulation training already. If he's training in this, what are Satsuki and Sakura training in? I need to seriously catch up, even though it's a drag to do so. Shikamaru remembered the promise he gave Naruto. I swore that I would get strong enough so that when you become Hokage, I would be your chief aide. Better start now before it's too late. Shikamaru quickly decided as Naruto's attention turned towards the shogi board. Naruto snorted when he examined the game. Man Shikamaru, you didn't have to go that hard on him. Naruto commented with a smirk on his face. Shikamaru smirked with him. Asuma took a deep puff of his cigarette to hide his embarrassment. Wanna play? Shikamaru asked while rearranging the board. Naruto nodded. Sure. Let's play one game before I start training. Naruto replied. The game quickly started with Asuma sitting on the side observing the game. Shikamaru gave Naruto the first move. Naruto watched as Shikamaru went after him and moved his next piece almost immediately afterwards. The Nara looked a little startled but moved another piece. Again Naruto moved one of his pieces almost immediately afterwards Choji and Ino found the energy to sit beside their Jonin sensei to watch the game. Shogi. Level 50 Shogi was a game that was purely strategic. When playing you use traps, making plans and strategies to take your opponent's pieces, and eventually placing your opponent's king in checkmate. It required a knack for thinking several steps in advance, the farther ahead you could plan out your maneuvers, the more likely you were to win. Thirteen moves into the game Shikamaru was sweating, having already used his thinking pose seven times in just as many moves, he was beginning to feel desperate. 
Geez, when did Naruto get so good at this? It's only been a couple of months. The Nara thought while studying the shogi board, thinking about strategy after strategy. He looked up at Naruto to see the blonde staring at the board with a calculative expression. Looking back at the board Shikamaru calculated the best strategy he could before moving his piece. Naruto then moved his piece right after. Shikamaru looked at the board carefully and moved another piece. Less than 10 minutes later Shikamaru was down to one gold general, one knight, his bishop and six pawns. Meanwhile Naruto had only lost a gold general and two pawns. It was only five minutes later that Shikamaru leaned over the board in shock, trying to figure out how he lost. He lost Shikamaru lost. Doji whispered in shock while Ino's jaw dropped to the ground in disbelief, wondering how her genius teammate lost. Asuma was also gaping at the scene. Having spent so much time trying to beat Shikamaru himself, it was rather hard to see someone else beat him, except for Shikamaru's father Shikaku, who is the Jonin. The Jonin commander is a position in the shinobi system of Kanahagakur. As a representative of the regular shinobi forces, they are a member of the council, giving them a say in important matters, such as choosing a new hokage. They are the highest ranking normal shinobi in the village, but still officially a jonin themselves. And for it to be the rookie of the year from Shikamaru's graduating class, was shocking to say the least. Asuma scratched his head while throwing away the cigarette that was already put out by him. I've never seen some of those maneuvers before. It's so unpredictable. Naruto managed to beat Shikamaru and only lost three pieces himself. That kind of thing can never be considered luck. Asuma thought while looking at the blonde Jinchiriki who grinned at Shikamaru. This will be the first of many future wins, Shikamaru. Naruto taunted as he raised his hand. Shikamaru sighed and shook it. Man, now I need to get better at Shogi too. So troublesome. Shikamaru grumbled as Naruto stood up to head out to the spacious training ground. He then held up his hands and crossed his index and middle fingers. Shadow clone Jutsu Puoff. A large plume of white smoke engulfed the area to reveal a group of 100 shadow clones. They didn't waste any time, and each grabbed a leaf to work on the leaf cutting exercise. Asuma looked at the horde of shadow clones with a real Naruto in the middle working on the exercise with his clones. Shadow clone Jutsu eh? He knows the secret to it too. Asuma smirked as he put his trench knife back into his pouch. Definitely an interesting kid. It will be interesting to see what another wind element user can do. A Jinjutsu is created when a ninja controls the chakra flow of a target's cerebral nervous system, thereby affecting their five senses. This is frequently used to create false images and or trick the body into believing it has experienced physical sensations such as pain. Because Jinjutsu affects activity throughout the prosencephalon structure of the brain, humans, dogs and other species of mammal are therefore all affected by Jinjutsu. Jinjutsu can also be used to manipulate others similar to brainwashing, by feeding the victim elusive suggestions. Methods include integration with nature transformation, as shown with water and lightning release, and ingesting special pills that activate when the target sleeps. Audible Jinjutsu is the most dangerous because the user can trap victims from long distances. Despite its usefulness, Jinjutsu is rarely employed, most shinobi preferring the real tangible effects of ninjutsu and tojutsu, over the imagined effects of Jinjutsu, which hold little influence over the physical world. The difficulty of performing Jinjutsu in the first place presents an additional barrier to its use. Jinjutsu require precise chakra control, in order to manipulate the target senses and advanced intelligence, to make the illusion convincing. You will only be recognized as a specialist in Jinjutsu when you create a technique of your own. Do you understand, Sakura? Kurinai asked as she turned to look at Sakura who nodded back at her. Understood, Kurinai-sensei. Cough. Cough. Kinjutsu pertains to techniques that entail the use of swords, whether the users be shinobi or samurai. Satsuki looked at the person who started talking to her. He is Hei Jeko, and he is a Takubetsu Jonin. Hei had short brown hair, dark colored eyes and dark markings under his eyes. Even though he was a young man, he had pronounced lines under his eyes, as well as an unexplained chronic cough that plagued him. He wore the standard Kanoha Shinobi outfit, complete with a forehead protector that he wore as a bandana, flak jacket and regular Shinobi sandals. He also carried a katana with a rectangular handguard strapped over his back. 
Hayate's signature skill was in Kenjutsu, and Kakashi thought it was best if he was the one to teach her in the art of the sword. Kenjutsu is an underrated shinobi art. Most people think it's just swinging a sword around. But let me tell you this Itsuki, with enough physical strength, you can swing so fast you'll create a compressed blade of air with a swing. Adding your lightning element to it makes it even more lethal. Hayate explained before having a small coughing fit. Sitsuki looked at her katana on the ground before looking back at the Takibetsu Jonin. Let's start right now, Hayate sensei. That's the spirit. Cough. Fuck I hate being sick. Where's Tsunade when you need her? One day later, Hiruzen looked at all the ninja who had assembled into his war room, where all the meetings of great importance were held. Many of them were Jonin for the Genin teams, however there were also a few Chunin who would be serving as proctors, as well as the few Jonin who would proctor for the event he had called them for. Hiruzen nodded, deciding to start since everyone was here. I'm sure you all know why you're being summoned here so I won't beat around the bush. Hiruzen started talking. It's already that time huh, time does fly by quickly. Kakashi mumbled to himself while shutting his adult novel. Asuma yawned and put his palm on Kurinai's butt and squeezed it, the Jinjutsu specialist blushed vividly and slapped his hand. Asuma chuckled as he moved his arm up to wrap it around her waist. Kurinai sighed and shook her head. They even thought they've been together for a year now, she still couldn't get used to public affection, preferring Asuma to show affection in private. I saw some of them in the village already. They don't like to waste time either. Genma commented. Kakashi put his hands in his pockets as he looked at Hiruzen. So when does it start? He asked. In a couple of weeks. Hiruzen replied, causing some, include Kakashi to mumble about it being sooner than expected. I'll announce it properly seven days from now. On the first day of the 21st moon, the Chunin selection exams will commence. But before we get to the announcement on who will be participating among our teams, I have some information I wish to tell you. It seems that Suna has sent a Jinchuriki here to participate in the exams. Hiruzen added with a frown on his face. Many in the room tensed up. Hiruzen sighed. In any event, it is not illegal for a Jinchuriki to participate in the exams, so long as they are a registered genin. So there is nothing any of us can do about it. I merely informed you so that you are aware of what your genin will be up against in the exams. Hiruzen explained. How accurate is this info, Lord Third? Kurinai asked him. I received the information several days ago via Jureya's spy network. The Hokage replied. He had only just managed to get a hold of the Sanin because of it, something that irked Hiruzen, even though there was nothing he could do about the man's elusiveness at the moment. Hiruzen took a puff from his smoking pipe before continuing. Now, I would like to hear from those who are watching over the Rookie Nine first. After their Hokage's request, Kakashi, Kurinai and Asuma stepped forward. Hiruzen looked at the three of them. Are there any genin you would like to enter into this year's Chunin selection exam? I don't believe I have to tell you, but after a genin completes a total of at least 32 missions, he or she is eligible for the Chunin exams. Of course normally a genin needs more than four times that number of missions before being considered for selection, but it is your choice. Now, starting with Kakashi. Kakashi who still had a lazy demeanor even though he's in front of the Hokage, stepped up. I Kakashi Haddock, leader of Team 7, nominated Chihasatsuki, Yuzumaki Naruto and Haruno Sakura to take part in the Chunin exams. Kakashi stated lazily. This caused a load of mutters to spread out among the other ninja. Haruka who was there wasn't surprised about Kakashi's decision. From what he heard from Hiruzen, Team 7 proved more than capable to handle themselves. He was instead worried about Kurinai's and Asuma's decisions. Being in the middle Kurinai stepped up. I, Kurinai Yuhi, leader of Team 7, nominate Inuzuka Kiba, Hayuga Hinata and Aburam Shino, to take part in the Chunin exams. I, Asuma Saratobi, leader of Team 10 which consists of Yamanaka Ino, Nara Shikamaru and Akimichi Choji. The same as to my left. Asuma mumbled. The mutterings got even louder after all three Jonin leaders had nominated their teams for the Chunin exams, something that had not happened in decades. Iruka had something to say about this. Lord Hokage, please let me have a word. Haruka requested politely. Hiruzen nodded, giving him permission. I may be speaking out of place, but these nine genin were all my students at the academy. I think Team 7 is capable to handle themselves, but it's the two other teams I'm worried about. 
They are all very talented of course, but it's still far too early for them to take the exam. They need more experience, I just can't understand their reasoning. Especially with two Jinchuriki coming to the exams. Iruka, you do know that I became a Chunin when I was six years younger than Naruto. Kakashi stated, knowing who Aruka was really worried about, despite claiming that he was worried about teammate and Ten. Yes, but that was during war times. It was a necessity for Shinobi in that era to become stronger in order to ensure Kano has victory. Then are you saying that you don't have faith in their talents, Aruka? Asuma asked him with a frown on his face. That's those nine are nothing like me, especially Naruto. But he is an extremely talented Shinobi that has even impressed me at times. Kakashi revealed. Several eyes widened and lots of mumbling accompanied this announcement, to impress the copy ninja, as a big deal apparently. It makes me wonder though. He had always been considered the dead last until last year, where his grades and skills skyrocketed, thanks to getting some outside help. I have to question the competence of the academy staff for having neglected Naruto like they had, if he had received more help in the beginning, he may have already been a chunin by now, possibly even a jonin. Haruka sighed and palmed his face. He still felt guilty for not noticing the sabotaging sooner until it was too late. And if what Kakashi just said was true, then the blonde could already have been one of their most powerful ninja by now. Haruka-san, while I understand that you're worried, and I'm sorry for saying this, you have to understand that they are no longer under your control. Kurinai commented. What she's trying to say is that they are no longer your students Haruka, they are our soldiers. Asuma corrected bluntly. Kurinai elbowed him for being so blunt and not considering the other person's feelings. Alright that's enough. Here is an interrupted before the argument got too far. He looked at Aruka. Aruka, I understand where you're coming from but they are right. It is not your decision to decide whether or not they can compete. I'm sorry for stepping out of line sir. It's alright Aruka, no harm done. Now on to the next nominations, Naruto was staring at the rock in front of him. He looked up to see that his 100 shadow clones were doing the same, and were waiting for him to speak. He then looked at Asuma who was training Team 10, leaving Naruto to his own devices. Since we haven't been able to find a waterfall with a good ledge to stand on, I want you to start cutting a rock using wind chakra. When you manage to split a rock down the middle, try cutting a rock into four pieces, and increase the number of cuts you can make from there. Naruto ordered. Without saying any more, the clone sat down and went into action. Wind Manipulation. Level 20 requires 10% less wind chakra to wind style jutsu. Naruto came up with a couple of new wind manipulation exercises, after absolutely mastering the shit out of the leaf cutting exercise. Naruto had read that the next step after cutting a leaf, was to cut a waterfall. Since there were no waterfalls that he had found that could be properly utilized for his wind training, he had decided to refine his cutting ability through other means. The first thing he had done was make shapes in the leaves that he would cut. Simple ones had first, squares, circles and the like, and then more complex shapes like animals and people. This was the next training method Naruto had invented that he felt would be another good step in his wind elemental training. He had actually gotten the general idea from a book he had read. It was a much older book that he had found when looking for theories on connecting to one's chakra through meditation exercises. The book he had found, which was a book from Suna on some of the older methods of wind manipulation theories, had claimed that a master of the wind element should be able to cut straight through a boulder using wind chakra. Not only that, but the cut would be so smooth that the entire surface on either side would be completely flat. He had at first tried to cut a boulder, but soon realized that with the level of his wind manipulation was at, such a complex and difficult task was next to impossible. So he went on to the next best thing which was cutting a rock. He felt that while it was not as good, it would still be a major advancement in his elemental training. After all, if he could cut a rock into several pieces then it should be much easier to cut flesh and bones. Before starting, Naruto also created 100 more shadow clones. He set 50 of them to work on the more advanced form of Muay Thai, and try to combine the Tejutsu styles they know into a usable form. The Jutsu. Level 40 increase punching strength by 20% chakra control. Level 39 Jutsu requires 19.5% less chakra he set the other 50 to work on his chakra control. His chakra control had gotten better but was still, and probably always would be an issue that he would need to constantly work on. 
We've gotten up to 5 leaves on one hand, so start adding leaves to the other. I want at least 2 added by the end of this session. And rather than walk on the water surface, I want you to run until you drop. Got it boss a week later hello, my cute little Jenin. Those are nice outfits you got there. Kakashi gave his students a wave as he walked onto a bridge where the three Jenin were. He looked at Sakura and Satsuki who donned new outfits that were more durable and useful than their old ones. Picks, thanks sensei. Why did you call us here? Sakura asked him. Kakashi gave them an eye smile as he took out three pieces of paper out from his pouch. You know sensei, you're still one minute late. Satsuki commented as she grabbed a piece of paper from Kakashi's hands. Ah, I had to help an old lady cross the street, only to find out that she was a missing ninja, and I was forced to fight her. Kakashi replied with an amused tone while looking cheerfully at Satsuki. At least you tried. Satsuki grumbled. Kakashi chuckled. Applications for the Chunin exams. Naruto whispered to himself while reading the words in the piece of paper. Though this is just a nomination, whether you take this exam is up to you. If you wish to take it should sign those papers and turn them in at room 301 by 4 p.m. tomorrow. That is all. See ya. Kakashi waved at them before disappearing via the body flicker jutsu. Naruto looked at his teammates. Well we all know what we're doing. We all have dreams to work towards. I wanna be Hokage, Sakura is gonna be the greatest medic nin in the whole world, and Satsuki is gonna be my shadow Hokage when I become the Hokage. Naruto stated. Satsuki raised an eyebrow at him. Since when did I say that? And since when did I allow you to decide that for me? Satsuki asked him while crossing her arms. Naruto grinned at the female Ichiha. You never said it. But I decided it when you said that you won't let me die on my journey to become Hokage. Naruto explained. Satsuki snorted before turning around to walk away from them. You probably need to find someone else for that, Naruto. I'm gonna go train with Hate sensei now. Satsuki whispered with a small smile and a blush on her face. Naruto laughed as he looked at Sakura. That means yes in the Ichiha language. Naruto explained, making Sakura giggle. They started walking through the streets of Konoha. Sakura looked at Naruto from the corner of her eye. She never knew why she hated him when she was in the academy save for the last year. But she guessed she hated him because she was immature and judged his appearance without getting to know him better. Naruto made her laugh, made her smile, and he cheers her whenever she feels insecure or sad. And he also made her have this intoxicating but also indescribable feeling in her heart whenever she thought about him. Ino would probably say something about Naruto being husband or boyfriend material, and she wouldn't be wrong about that. What if Naruto was my boyfriend? Sakura thought but immediately blushed vividly the second after. Naruto looked at her and tilted his head. She must be thinking about boys if she's having that expression. It should be me and I hope it is. Naruto thought confidently before hearing a noise from behind him. He turned around and saw a square box behind him with a rock texture painted on it. It also had two eye holes in the front. Sakura looked at it curiously and wanted to say something, but Naruto put his index finger on her lips, making her flustered at his actions. Follow me. He whispered silently. Sakura nodded repeatedly as they started walking. The box followed them as they turned a corner. The box suddenly stopped as it turned the corner Naruto and Sakura did. They didn't see the blonde or the pink-haired beauty anywhere. Kanoha Marukun where did the boss go? Asked a female voice from the box. I don't know, it's like he disappeared. Kanoha Maru exclaimed. They were just about to lift the box up when Naruto appeared behind them. Grinning he sat down on them, listening to their muffled grunts and shouts of surprise. Hey who's on top of us? Get off. I think my glasses broke. What's going on? Hearing their shouts made Naruto laugh loudly while Sakura giggled, watching it on the sidelines. If you keep using these shitty ass disguises you'll never get the upper hand on me. Believe it. Ha. Huh. I'm not surprised you saw through it boss. Now can you get off ya yeah, ya yeah, kids these days, Naruto grumbled as he stood up. He stood up to the front as the box of exploded. Cough. I think we use too much gunpowder. Cough. A nasally voice said. Naruto gave the kids a nonchalant look that would make Kakashi proud. So what do you kids want? The three kids looked up at him before they broke into their introduction. Hey I'm Mogi Kazamitsuri. And I'm the sassiest Kanoichi in school. Mogi introduced herself. 
Mogi wore goggles just like Naruto did when he was an academy student. She has orange hair tied up with red elastics into two very large pigtails. She also has a perpetual blush. I'm Yudenice and I like algebra. Yudin went next. Yudin has short brown hair and dark eyes. He is characterized by the drip of snot always seen hanging from his nose and his circular glasses. He wore a simple blue shirt which zipped up the middle, a pair of brown pants, sandals and a pair of goggles to represent his membership in the Konohamaru Ninja Squad. And I'm the strongest ninja in the village, Konohamaru Siratobi. The leader of the Konohamaru Ninja Squad and grandson of Hiruzen, Konohamaru introduced himself cheerfully. Konohamaru has short spiky brown hair, blue eyes, and a small chip in his tooth. He wears Naruto's old goggles, and his clothing consists of grey shorts and a yellow shirt, with a red Konoha symbol printed on it. And together we're the Konohamaru Ninja Corps. The three said in unison. Naruto and Sakura smiled at how cheerful the three kids are. Naruto chuckled and shook his head. Yeah I know, you guys have done this like 30 times already this month alone. And also Konohamaru, the strongest ninja in this village currently is your gramps, who is the Hokage. Naruto smirked at Konohamaru who huffed and looked away from him. So what do you three want now? I'm busy right now. Naruto looked at Sakura when he finished his sentence. Sakura blushed, mistaking Naruto's words as him going on a date with her. You promised you'd play ninja with us today boss. Konohamaru stated as he crossed his arms. Did I really? Naruto hummed and tilted his head. You did boss. Come on, please play ninja with us. The three started giving him the puppy dog eyes, something Naruto somehow resisted. Hey, I've been giving Gramps that look before you three were even born, it won't work on me. Naruto smirked as they immediately became gloomy. He liked the trio whom he had taken to calling the Jibe Brigade, they always seemed to brighten his day. But I suppose I've got enough time to play ninja with you. You wanna join, Sakura-chan? Naruto asked Sakura who shrugged. Sure, as long as you don't make me the damsel in distress. Sakura replied as she joined the group. Konohamaru looked at Sakura and Naruto. He smirked slyly. So boss, is she your girlfriend? Konohamaru asked him. Sakura immediately blushed brightly at his question. Naruto grinned broadly at him. How do you know? And Naruto, ha 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 ha. Naruto chuckled as he rubbed the back of his head. After his answer, Sakura bonked his head. Although it was a light bonk, it still hurt a little. HMPH. Sakura huffed and looked away from him, hiding her face that was as red as a rose. Konohamaru, Mogi and Yudin were shocked at Naruto's answer. Seriously boss she's your girlfriend you can do better than this chick. I mean just look at her. That pink hair is kind of weird and can you see her forehead, it's larger than Hokage Rock. Konohamaru declared while pointing at Sakura. Pack. Konohamaru grunted and staggered back as he just got slapped in the face by Naruto, who had a dark shadow covering his eyes. He glared at Naruto angrily. What the hell was that for? The blonde crouched down in front of him while looking at him seriously, scaring Konohamaru. You better take that back, Konohamaru. Sakura-chan isn't weird. She's drop-dead gorgeous. And you better believe it. Someone like you with no taste in girls at all could never understand just how beautiful she is. Naruto pointed at Sakura who had a flustered expression hearing his compliments about her. Her pink hair makes her stand out, and that's great because I like staring at it all day. It smells good too. Also, her future boyfriend is gonna be one lucky bastard because he gets to leave a bunch of kisses on her forehead. So you better take those words back, Konohamaru. How's I'll be having none of that disrespect to my precious people? Believe it, Naruto shouted. Konohamaru nodded repeatedly before saluting him. Why yes boss he shouted. Naruto grinned at him. Good. Now apologize to her. Naruto requested Konohamaru immediately bow deeply at Sakura. I'm so sorry for saying those things he declared. Sakura laughed nervous. Ah, don't worry about it. I get this all the time. Sakura replied to him with a smile on her face, making Konohamaru even more guilty for making fun of her. Alright, now that that's over with. Let's go play ninja. Naruto muttered as he got up. He started walking with the Konohamaru ninja squad, with Sakura walking closely by his side. Sakura had a blush on her face as she kept replaying what Naruto said when he was scolding Konohamaru in her mind. H he said I'm pretty. 
He likes my forehead and my pink hair and he always asks me on dates oh, why did I bully him? Sakura thought to herself, feeling guilty for doing such horrible things to her friend. She knew that he would just shrug it off, which made her feel even more guiltier. Naruto had been the only factor of her confidence back in the academy. Whenever something happened, whether it was something Ino or one of the other girls did or said, Naruto had always been there to make her feel better about herself. She started staring at Naruto and his handsome face. She stared at his confident grin and his whisker marks on his cheeks. Her heart raced faster than ever and her face turned red again. Oh Sage. What's happening? Why's my heart beating so fast? Am I gonna die? Sakura put her hand on where her heart was. Her breathing became fast. Oi. Sakura widened her eyes and looked up at Naruto who was looking at her with a concerned expression. Are you okay, Sakura-chan? Are you sick? Do I need to take you home? He asked while getting closer to the pink-haired Kanoichi. Hey, ah, it's alright Naruto I'm just feeling a little hot, Sakura stuttered as she backed up a little. Naruto hummed and squinted his eyes at her, making Sakura look away. Hold my hand, Sakura-chan. Naruto suddenly requested while holding out his right hand. Sakura widened her eyes as her blush reddened. WH what? She stuttered weakly. Naruto raised an eyebrow at her. Hold it so that you can calm down. Don't worry, I will always be here by your side, Sakura-chan. Believe it. Naruto grinned confidently at her. Sakura nodded repeatedly before holding his hand. Naruto intertwined it as the continued walking. Surprisingly it actually calmed her down as she felt safe when holding the blonde's large warm hand. Come on boss. Pick up the pace. Kanohimaru shouted as he ran past Yudin and Mogi. He turned around a corner and continued running until he crashed into someone and fell down to the ground. Oh Kanohimaru rubbed his face which was stinging from the pain of bumping into someone. He looked up at the person he bumped into. The person was Kankuro, a shinobi of Sunagakur's Kazakiage clan. He is the second child to Kurora and the fourth Kazakiage, Rasa, making him the second eldest of the three Sans siblings. Kankuro bears a striking resemblance to his father, though usually seen on account of his costume and makeup. Kankuro wore a Benraku puppeteer's costume, a black baggy full bodysuit with a red and yellow circle on the front. He also wears a black hood which covered his head completely, and had cat-like ears and his forehead protector on his forehead. Both this and later outfits are derived from traditional Benraku puppeteer costumes. Benraku puppeteers usually wear black outfits and hoods, so as not to distract from their puppets. Kankuro sported a triangular facipant design. He also wears gloves and carries his puppets on his back. Beside him stood Tamari, Kinoichi of Sunagakur's Kazakiage clan and the eldest of the three San siblings. Tamari bears a great resemblance to her mother Karara. She has teal eyes and sandy blonde hair, which is gathered into four consecutive pigtails. Tamari's outfit consists of a single light purple-colored off-the-shoulders garment that extended to halfway down her thighs, with a scarlet sash tied around her waist. In addition to incorporating fishnet worn over her shoulders and legs, specifically on her right calf and her left thigh, she also wore her black forehead protector around her neck. The headbands they were wearing was the symbol for Sunagakur, the village hidden in the sand, which was a ninja village allied to Kanoha. That hurt you little punk. Hankuro shouted as he bent down to pick Kanohamaru up by his scarf, forcing the kid to grab onto his hand. I think I need to teach you a lesson about watching where you're going. Kankuro declared as Kanohamaru had fear in his eyes. Tamari scowled and shook her head in annoyance. Kankuro just drop him, you know we're going to get in trouble if he shows up. Tamari warned him. Hankuro looked at her. Relax Tamari, he won't show up for a while yet. Besides, this kid needs to learn not to disrespect his betters. Kankuro replied as he looked back at Kanohamaru. Put me down your stupid makeup wearing freak if you don't my big bro's gonna beat you up, Kanohamaru shouted. Kankuro growled at him. It's war paint you little shit. I'll teach you a lesson for messing with your betters, Kankuro shouted before raising his fist. You know, if you're trying to look threatening you're doing a piss poor job of it. Kankuro and Tamari looked up to see Naruto standing before them with a serious expression on him. He was glaring daggers at Kankuro who had a smirk on his face. A few seconds later, Sakura whose hand he let go came up behind him with Mogi and Yudin, and watched the small confrontation. Naruto smirked at him. I think that might have something to do with the makeup. 
Please put the boy down, you won't like the consequences. Naruto resumed as his serious expression returned. Kankuro scowled while Tamari blushed. Oh, he looks handsome. I like those whiskers. Tamari thought while eyeing the blonde up and down. Those look like Kanohe Genin. Maybe I should play with them for a while instead. Kankuro thought with a sneer. When Naruto did not receive a reply from either of the Suna Genin, he scowled deeply at them, revealing his sharp fangs. Hey makeup boy. I said you might want to let him go. If you're not going to listen to me, I can persuade you better by putting my foot up in your ass, you better believe it, Naruto shouted. That seemed to get a reaction as Kankuru scowled and Tamari giggled. It's not makeup asshole. It's war paint. Kankuru yelled. Naruto raised an eyebrow and looked at him with an amused face. So you wearing a cat suit doesn't make you a transvestite then Naruto shouted back. A transvestite is a person who dresses in clothes primarily associated with the other SEX typically used of a man. Basically Naruto called him a cosplayer and a sissy at the same time. That does it, you better not regret it after I'm done with you. Kankuro said as he grit his teeth. He tossed Konohamaru away and reached behind his back to the large mummified looking object. Naruto disappeared in a burst of speed as he rushed behind the young Siratobi and caught Konohamaru, setting the boy down, before he turned a glare on Kankuro. Tamari looked at her little brother with a shocked expression. You're going to use Karasu here. She asked him. These brats need to be taught a lesson Tamari. Kankuro replied as he began to unravel the bandages. Suddenly, a kunai was thrown at him out of nowhere. Shik. Arg Kankuro growled as he had a kunai embedded in his hand. He looked to see Satsuki standing beside Naruto while spinning a kunai in her hand. Get lost before I send you back in a body bag to Suna. Satsuki threatened while activating her Sharingan. Naruto appeared behind Kankuro and pointed his tri-pronged kunai at his neck, while Sakura appeared in front of Kankuro and pointed her kunai at his forehead. Not laughing now are ya? Don't move or I'll kill you. You don't want to start the fourth great ninja war with your stupidity now. Naruto whispered menacingly, making Kankuro shiver down his spine. This feeling felt so familiar. The only one who can make him shiver in fear like this was Gara, his little brother. Stop and listen to him, Kankuro. Gee Gara, Kankuro stuttered as he began to shake in fear. Tamari did not seem to be doing much better. Who is he? I noticed him coming a long time ago, but it still required channeling chakra to my ears. His footsteps are so silent it's basically non-existent. Satsuki thought while studying Gara and what he looked like. Gara is a genin and the youngest of the three sand siblings. He was made the Jinchuriki of the one-tailed Shukaku before he was born, causing the villagers of Suna to fear him as a monster. Gara has fair skin, green eyes, and short spiky auburn hair. He lacks distinctive pupils or eyebrows, the latter of which others sometimes make fun of. He's had tanuki-like black rings around his eyes his whole life, which Satsuki attributed to insomnia. As a child, he carved the kanji for love on the left side of his forehead, which his hair is parted in order for it to be kept visible. He is handsome, but he got ruined in Baruto. Gara wore a black bodysuit with an open neck, t-shirt-like sleeves, and almost full-length leggings. With this, he wore a white cloth over his right shoulder and the left side of his hips. He had a wide leather band from his left shoulder to his right hip, with which he carried his sand gourd, and around which he wrapped his forehead protector. Ankuro, you're an embarrassment to our village. Have you already forgotten why we came here? Gara's arms were still crossed as he stared his older brother down. Kankuro visibly paled. W well G Gara they started it and I shut up, or I'll kill you. Gara interrupted while staring into Kankuro's eyes. All right, I was totally out of line, Kankuro stuttered. Gara then disappeared in a swirl of sand, reappearing in between Tamari and Kankuro. He looked over at Team 7 and increased his killing intent in an effort to frighten the blonde. Satsuki and Sakura became cautious while Naruto just shrugged, which made Gara raise a brow. My apologies for him being such a nuisance. Gara apologized to Naruto eventually. Naruto gave a grin at him. Meh, it's all good. Though I really suggest keeping him on a tight leash, seeing as how he almost beat up the Hokage's grandson. Wars have started for less after all. Naruto revealed. Kankuro paled even more at the new knowledge, knowing he was going to get in trouble for doing something like this with his sensei, Baki. I'll keep that in mind. Kankuro, Tamari, let's go. 
Bara muttered as he, Kankuro and Tamari started walking away. Hey, are you guys here for the Chunin exams? Naruto asked. Tamari looked back at him and nodded. Well, you better hope your opponent is not me. Cause I'm not holding back, even though you're a beautiful woman. Believe it. Naruto declared. Tamari blushed, not used to having someone call her beautiful or having the guts to do it in front of Gara. Growing up as a daughter to the fourth Kazakiage and elder sister to Gara, Tamari had a hard time making friends as everyone was always intimidated by her lineage. I it's alright. She stuttered. Naruto gave her a thumbs up. So what's your name? Naruto asked her. Whumi. Tamari asked with a light blush on her face. Naruto grinned at her. Yes you. It's Tamari, Tamari of the Sand. And you. Yuzumaki Naruto. Future Hokage. Naruto introduced himself before pointing at Gara, who looked at him in curiosity. How about you? What's yours? Naruto asked him. It's Gara. Gara replied silently. Shukaku. Naruto widened his eyes as he heard the Kaiubi's voice in his head. Shukaku. Naruto questioned before shaking his head. He smirked at Gara. What about her? Gara asked while looking at Satsuki. Tamari and Kankura were shocked, Gara never ever went out of his way to ask for someone's name. Icha Satsuki. I see. I hope to see you too in the exams. Gara replied before leaving, with his two siblings following him. He died ask for my name. Kankuro thought while crying dramatically in his mind. Naruto sighed as he looked at Sakura and Satsuki. Well that was interesting. He muttered to which they nodded back. That Gara guy gave me the creeps. He's leaking killing intent like a homicidal maniac. Sakura commented while rubbing her arms, feeling uncomfortable even though Gara already left. I think I know why. Naruto muttered as his two teammates turned their heads to look at him. I think Gara is just like me. Naruto revealed while pointing at his stomach, where the 8 trigram seal was. They were shocked to say the least. A couple of weeks later, it was the day where the Chunin exams start. Naruto was at his apartment storing some equipment into containment scrolls. Each one contained a set number of necessary supplies, kunai, shuriken, ninja wire, flash bangs, smoke bombs, custom-made exploding notes and various forms of weaponry. Having hung out with Tenten as much as he had, Naruto had learned the value of being a walking armory. Naruto grabbed several scrolls, each one contained well over the necessary amount for a standard air rank mission. It was another habit he had picked up from his cute weapon using friend. Feeling ready he went into the kitchen to eat, and then he would head over to the academy. When approaching the academy, Naruto found his two teammates has just arrived too. What a coincidence, we're all 30 minutes early. Naruto smirked at Satsuki who rolled her eyes. Idiot, you were the one who told us to arrive at 3.30pm. Satsuki grumbled, making Naruto and Sakura laugh a little. Sakura sighed and looked at the academy building, feeling a sense of nostalgia in her. She looked back at her teammates. Let's go you two. They made their way into the academy building and started walking up the stairs where the first stage of the Chunin exams will begin. When they reached the second floor, they found a 30 genin standing around a double door with two other genin blocking said door and beating anyone who tried to get past them. We've only gone up one flight of stairs right? Naruto whispered to Sakura who nodded back at him. So how come the door says 301 oh, Naruto smirked as he realized something. Sakura smiled at his expression. It's Jinjutsu isn't it, Sakura-chan? Naruto mumbled. Sakura nodded. Those two genin guarding the door must be a part of it too. They must be using the transformation jutsu. They're keeping the unworthy out. Satsuki muttered. Now that you mention it, don't they look like the two gate guards, Katetsu and Izumo? Sakura wondered. Naruto shrugged. Well, it's not our problem. We're here to succeed, not help people who can't even stop and think for a second. I don't want to contend with a bunch of losers who couldn't even see through a simple Jinjutsu Satsuki muttered. Please let us through. Naruto stopped just as he and his teammates were about to reach the next set of stairs. He heard the familiar voice, turning around he focused his attention on a familiar brown-haired girl. He looked at Tenten and smirked. So she's here too huh? I should have known her team would be in these exams, they have a year's worth of experience over me, and their sensei is a training nut after all. Naruto whispered. Sakura looked at where Naruto was looking. Do you know her? The pink-haired Kanoichi asked. Naruto nodded. 
Yeah, she's a part of Team 9. I trained with her and her team before. Don't bother, she's just acting. Naruto replied as Tenten looked at Naruto and winked cutely at him. Naruto smirked and winked back before he continued walking. Naruto, Satsuki and Sakura walked towards the set of stairs that were in front of them. They saw someone standing on the next floor with a serious expression on his face. My name is Rock Lee. You with black hair. I wish to challenge you. Hey. Why not me Lee? Naruto asked him. Lee looked at him and grinned. Because we already fought yesterday, Naruto. Lee replied, making Naruto chuckle. Satsuki hummed as she looked up at Lee. Rock Lee is Genin and a member of Team Guy. Unlike most shinobi, he lacked the skills necessary to use ninjutsu or jinjutsu. However, he overcomes those shortcomings by undergoing special training from Guy that would make him a tojutsu master while still a genin. Lee has shiny black hair, round eyes with prominent lower eyelashes, and very thick eyebrows, as a result, Naruto calls him Bushy Brows and calls Guy Bushier Brows. Lee's appearance emulates his idol and sensei Guy. His hair is now in a bowl-cut style, he wears a green jumpsuit, orange leg warmers, and a red forehead protector worn as a belt. He has bandages around his forearms up to his fingers, covering a set of stitches on his hands that were caused by his rigorous training. Lee jumped and landed in front of them. He got into the beginning stance of the strong fist, feet together with one fist tucked into his side, and his other hand out in a bring it on gesture. Itcha Satsuki. Satsuki replied. Lee nodded. So it is true, you are this year's Kanoichi of the year. I have heard a lot about you from Naruto, it would be an honor to fight you. Lee exclaimed. Satsuki blinked and looked at Naruto. You told him about me? She asked Naruto who shrugged nonchalantly. Satsuki sighed and looked at Lee. Listen Lee, how about we save it for the exams? Satsuki offered, making Lee confused. Huh? I would like the both of us to enter the first stage in one piece, thank you very much. Satsuki grumbled as she started walking away. Naruto smiled and patted Lee's shoulder. You'll get your chance later Lee. For now, just focus on what's in front of us, you are Sakura-san yes? Lee asked Sakura with a blush on his face. Naruto groaned and palmed his face. Um yeah. Sakura replied while taking multiple steps back from him. I am Rock Lee. Let's go out sometimes, I will protect you with my life. Lee gave the pin cat the nice guy pose, completing it with gleaming teeth and a wink. Sakura deadpanned at him. Um no thank you she stated as an I'm tears immediately streamed down Lee's face. But why not Sakura-san? Because you're not my type. Sakura replied to him. Then what is your type, Sakura-san? Lee asked. Sakura blushed. She signaled Lee to come closer to her. Lee leaned in as Sakura whispered something into his ear. Lee listened to what she whispered to him before he widened his eyes and his jaw dropped in pure disbelief. He jumped back and looked at Sakura who was flustered. Why it's Sakura-chan? What did he say to you? Naruto asked Sakura who blushed and didn't answer him. Naruto pouted and crossed his arms. Good thinking back there by the way, you chose your battles wisely. Although he can't do ninjutsu and jinjutsu, Lee is an absolute monster in tojutsu. He has far more experience and his training methods are ridiculous. Naruto said while looking at Satsuki. H.N. Satsuki hummed back with a nod. That means I just need to push myself even more to get to his level. Satsuki thought. She raised an eyebrow when she saw Kakashi standing in front of room 301, the room they were supposed to enter to take the first stage of the Chunin exams. Sensei. Why are you here? Satsuki asked him. Kakashi hummed and looked up. Noticing that it was his students, he closed his adult novel and put it away into his pouch. He gave his students an eye smile. Well, I'm glad to see you three came. Had one of you not made it, I would have had to disqualify all of you. Kakashi revealed. I thought the exams were optional. Sakura asked in confusion. Kakashi nodded. They are, Sakura. But at the same time they have to be taken as a team. Kakashi explained. Naruto smirked and looked at Satsuki and Sakura. It's a good thing we're all here then. Let's smash this exam and be tuning together. Naruto declared with a broad grin on his face. H.N. Satsuki nodded back seriously. Got it. Sakura replied with a smile on her face. Kakashi smiled under his mask. You're all here for the right reasons. 
I know I don't say this too much, but I'm proud of you three. Now go in there and make me the proudest sensei in Konoha. Kakashi ordered them. Naruto's grin looked like it was about to slip his face, Sakura's smile couldn't get any warmer, while Satsuki had a confident smirk on her face. The three genin stepped past their sensei. They opened the doors and entered the room where the first part of the Chunin exams would start. The very moment Team 7 had entered the room, every single genin began glaring at them. Many of the genin teams, who were older than them by several years, began leaking killing intent at the trio. Team 7 who have been through far worse from Zabuza, shrugged them off and began glaring back at them, giving them a dose of their own killing intent that they had Kakashi help them develop. They smirked as some teams shivered while some of them quickly looked away from them. Naruto hummed as he looked at Team 10 approaching them. Shikamaru yawned as he gave Naruto a fist bump. Hey. You guys are here too. Shikamaru whispered lazily. Naruto nodded while giving Choji a fist bump. Yup. You guys ready for this? Naruto asked Choji and Shikamaru, making sure not to raise his voice. Even though Naruto is loud, he knows when to be quiet, and right now, he does not want to be annoying to others. Well, I don't think so strength-wise. But if we strategize, be observant and cautious, I think we can ace this. Shikamaru replied. Ino meanwhile was having a girl talk session with Sakura and Satsuki. H hello, Naruto-kun. Naruto hummed and turned around to look at Hinata who was smiling shyly at him. Hey Hinata. How are you? Naruto asked Hinata. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Um listen eh after this see can we go. Naruto finally found Yukiba who greeted Naruto cheerfully immediately froze and shivered uncontrollably. He looked at Hinata who had her Byakugan activated and was glaring daggers at him. Wh what did I do? Kiba mumbled. Shino who stood beside him shook his head. You interrupted Hinata when she was being courageous. Shino explained, confusing Kiba even more. Naruto scratched his head. Um, Hinata. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Naruto replied to her. Hinata blushed vividly, her only reply was to smile happily at him. You know, you guys should really keep it down and find your seats. The three genin teams looked over to see one of the older genin walking towards them. The older genin's name was Kabuto. Kabuto has onyx eyes and ash gray hair, which he normally keeps in a ponytail. His most consistent feature are his black rimmed circular glasses. Kabuto wears a dark purple shirt with a high collar, a white undershirt, and dark purple pants with a white cloth waistband. He also wears dark purple fingerless gloves with armored plates on the back of the hand, and a blue Kanoha forehead protector. Kabuto pushed up his glasses. You guys are the rookies who just came out of the academy right? I wouldn't be so loud if I were you. Kabuto advised them. Naruto narrowed his eyes at him. And who are you? Naruto asked him. My name's Kabuto Yakushi and before you say anything more, look behind you. Every followed Kabuto's instructions and turned around. They were subjected to another dose of killing intent particularly from the genin from Omegakur, the village hidden in the rain. That team from AIM, I heard they have short tempers. Kabuto muttered to them. Naruto smirked, deciding to add fuel to the fire. He jumped onto one of the tables and grinned broadly at them. Listen up your chicken shit pansies. My name is Yuzumaki Naruto, if any of you want a piece of me get in a nice and orderly single file line, and I'll kick each and every one one of your asses real quick, his declaration earned various reactions in the room. Yosh. Naruto-kun seems to be in full youthful form today. Lee said energetically after seeing his friend and sparring partner being so enthusiastic. Tenton giggled. Is it just me, or has he gotten even worse with that mouth of his? She wondered. It's the fate of losers like him to be loud. Niji Hayuga sneered. Lee and Tenton frowned at their Hayuga teammate. Niji had fair skin and long black hair, which the Anaim usually depicted as dark brown. When his Byakugan was not active he has featureless white eyes with a slight lavender tint. Niji wore a beige-colored shirt, a dull blue shirt beneath that, and mesh armor beneath that. He wore dark brown shorts, blue shinobi sandals, and wrapped bandages around his right arm, chest, and right leg. He tied his hair back in a loose ponytail tied a few inches above the end. He wore a black forehead protector, under which was a smaller headband with two straps that framed the sides of his face. It's that damn kid again, that punk is gonna get himself killed for sure. That's a good thing. Kankuro grinned as the blonde stepped off the table. 
Tamari looked at Kankuro with a smirk on his face. I don't know about that, Kankuro. I think he makes things kind of interesting. Maybe I should ask him on a date after this. Tamari replied to him, making Kankuro stutter, while Gara just stared at Naruto impassively. Two Kumonin stared at them. One of them scowled deeply at Naruto, while the other sighed and shook his head. Your name is Kabuto, right? Sakura asked him. Kabuto nodded while pushing up his glasses. Yay, that's right. So is this your first time taking these exams? The pink-haired Kinoichi asked. Kabuto chuckled and shook his head while having an embarrassed blush on his face. No, this is my seventh. Kabuto replied, surprising her. Seventh. Either you suck the proctor's dick or these exams are harder than I thought. Naruto commented. Kabuto chuckled. It's the latter I assure you. However you know what they say, seventh time's the charm. And it's not like I didn't get anything out of it. Since you guys are new and all, why don't I give you a hand? Kabuto offered while taking a deck of cards out of his pouch. He kneeled down on the ground and began channeling Chakra into the top card. There was a small burst of smoke as he flipped it over. The rookie Jenin leaned in to see that it showed a map of the elemental nations, on each nation was a bar with a number. These are my info cards. Look here, as you can see Kanoha has the most teams participating. Of course that's a given since we're on home turf. But just about every shinobi village has brought Jenin here to participate. We've even got a team from Kumo this year, a rarity considering we're not on good terms with them. Naruto widened his eyes hearing that there were Kumo shinobi in the room and looked around to search for them. He saw a man and a woman. The man's name is Amoi. Amoi is a young, dark-skinned Kumonin with short, spiky, white hair and dark eyes accentuated with eyelashes curving upwards from the corners. He wears a dark outfit consisting of an overlong shirt with a hood, with red bandage hand guards, Kumagakur shin guards, and a black forehead protector, along with a Kumagakur flak jacket. He is always seen with a thoughtful expression, as though always in deep contemplation and sucking on a lollipop. He also carries a long sword on his back. Naruto then looked at the girl sitting beside Amoi. Her name is Kari. Kari is a dark-skinned Kanoichi with long spiky red hair and amber eyes. She is flat-chested. She wears a long, short-sleeved dress with frilly edges, complete with a Kumagakur flak jacket, two simple yellow earrings, fishnet stockings, thigh-high boots with white soles, and a forehead protector which she wears like a bandana. She also carries a long sword on her back. Beautiful. Naruto thought, noticing how beautiful the dark-skinned Kanoichi was despite her cold serious demeanor. Harry and Naruto locked eyes with each other. Kari blushed a little and scowled at Naruto. She gave him the middle finger before turning back to talk with Amoi. Naruto sighed as his attention was brought back to Kabuto. Do your cards hold individual information? Shikamaru asked him. Kabuto smirked. Of course, all I need is a name, or even initials, and I can find them for you. He replied. Shikamaru nodded, already having several on his mind. Give me everything you have on Rock Lee of Kanoha, Gara of the Sand, Satsuki Achiha, Haruno Sakura and Yuzumaki Naruto. Choji looked at Shikamaru, wondering why would he want information about them. It's called planning ahead. Shikamaru whispered as Choji quickly understood his reasons. Man, you know their names and everything, that's no challenge at all. Kabuto mumbled as he held up three cards. One of them went up in smoke to reveal Lee's card. Let's see, Rock Lee has completed 25 D-rank and 21 C-rank missions. His teammates are Higurashi Tenten, who is last year's Kanoichi of the Year, and Hai Uganichi, who is last year's Rookie of the Year. Says here that in the academy he had no skills to speak of, but in the last year his Tajutsu made a phenomenal jump. Last year he could have entered the Chunin exams, but his sensei held the team back a year to gain more experience. Next we have Gara of the Sand. It says here he's done 8 C-rank missions, 27 B-rank missions and get this, 1 A-rank mission. His teammates are Tamari of the Sand and Kankuro of the Sand who are his older siblings. Apparently they're the children of the Kazakiage. Also, this is just a rumor, but apparently he's come out of every single mission without even getting a scratch. Naruto eyed Gara. So he's pretty strong then, bet it'll be a blast fighting him. He thought as Kabuto continued. Then we have Ichiha Satsuki. She has completed WoW 210 D-rank and 2 A-rank missions. Her teammates are Yuzumaki Naruto and Haruno Sakura. 
She has a one tomo sharingan, as great at ninjutsu, tojutsu, jinjutsu and kinjutsu. Then comes Hirano Sakura. Her mission records and teammates are the same as Itsuki's. She is a genius at chakra control, has great medical knowledge, and knows the mystical palm jutsu. Last is Yuzumaki Naruto. Let's see huh, that's odd. It says he also has one B rank mission that was not given to his other two teammates. He's great at tojutsu, fuinjutsu, great at dispelling jinjutsu with his chakra disruption jutsu, and knows the shadow clone jutsu. Shikamaru was narrowing his eyes at Kabuto's descriptions about everyone, especially Naruto's. These are very descriptive, too descriptive. And it looks like Naruto has the same train of thought as I do. Shikamaru though while looking at the blonde who is narrowing his eyes at Kabuto. That B rank about dealing with Mizuki is supposed to be off the records. How does he know about it? Naruto thought as Shikamaru approached him and pulled him in. Naruto, I don't want to sound paranoid, but this situation right now might be a matter of Kanoha's security. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.